on this episode of the Star Wars Time Show! Matt Nick will take on the task of breaking down two high-impact type of episodes from the Bad Batch's final season. Who is having an identity crisis and why is there a point of no return? The Dude Bros will have these answers and more, even if they're not correct. If anything, they'll do their best to figure out what's in store for next week after this two-parter blasted the fan base. Of course, the show will end with the question of the week responses and the latest round of Top High Star Wars Fan Artist Features. Punch it, Chewie. Everybody, how's that for an A plus transition? <laughs> Get some. Where's Bat? I know he's always keeping score on how well we transition into the actual show. Hopefully, you all can even see what we're doing right now because I see we are getting a a no data over on YouTube, even though it says we're live. So who knows? Hopefully, you can hear us and see us. We're just gonna keep going because <laughs> uh, hey, excellent connection. Yeah, we're good. We're, we're, good. See, we're, we're <laughs> up there. Fuck you, YouTube. See, I mean, it, it's like, hey, you don't, you're not sending enough KBPSs. I'm, I'm like, bro, I, I'm just see it right now. It's eight thousand. I know it's not over nine thousand, but it's eight thousand. That's plenty. We're looking good now. The light is green. Hey, now we got JRO, Bat, Nova, the usuals. This is the way has made it in at the start of the show. And there is Mando Pirate. You might be asking, if you're just listening on your radio or the podcast version of the SWTS, who the hell are these magical, mystical, invisible people Matt is talking about? Well, they happen to be our top fandos for the live stream. So if you want to join in with them and interact with the two dummies that run this show, myself and Young Nick, don't forget Wednesday nights, youtube.com slash Star Wars Time Show, 5P East or as close as we can get <sighs> all right buddy it's a double double dipping type of week of bad batch so you know yep. we got that planned for a little bit down the road it'll be our last segment before the fan segment this week uh but before we get there we you know we typically like to talk a little pop culture if there's something poppy enough to talk about and it just so happens like i promised you last week i i tend to as people say fall on grenades of pop culture for people <laughs> and I told young Nick I would go check out Godzilla X Kong: The New Empire because I'm not gonna lie, I I kind of dig this franchise, whatever it's called. I don't know if it's the Titan Universe, the Godzilla Verse, the God Kong Verse. Either way, I'm a fan. The kid and I, we did a rewatch of the four movies that came out before God X Kong: New Empire. We got our tickets, rolled over there last Thursday, Nick, and. I, I, I know you think I'm brain dead, and that's okay. Like I, we just our, our brains operate at a different level when it comes to entertainment. But I fucking love this movie. Uh, Godzilla X Kong: The New Empire might be my favorite Titan film at this point in time. It gets a little, you know, a little shit wonky pacing wise in the final act. Uh, but the opening, and you know, for the first two thirds or whatever, I was I was very intrigued. I'm becoming a lover of the Kong. Uh, like mm-hmm. I feel for this thing, and the movie does a good job at you kind of making making you feel for his situation. Because if you think about it, if you if you think about this franchise, we've essentially been following Kong since the seventies in Skull Island, and now we're up in in modern times. So he's he's aging. He's now in his new home in Hidden Earth, um, but he's missing his family, and then that's kind of what this this deals with. And <laughs> then you, you you got. Godzilla, you know, King Titan that is ready to kill any other Titan or nuclear energy on the planet the moment he senses it, which adds some uh, interesting wrinkles into the mix. Uh, but I'm telling you right now, this is this is just good, mostly brain dead monster movie action. It, it just is. I'm sorry. Like, yeah, you're not going to get deep, a deep narrative. But it, 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 you know, it continues this this franchise. It keeps the stories going. It adds a few new wrinkles. And uh, quite frankly, I like I said, I, I think it, it's one of the best. Not that that's saying a ton, but it's it's definitely eye candy with some humor and a, a story that's that's worth sitting through. 
So I know I'm not going to convince you, Nick, but other people out there that might, you know, have AMC Stubbs A-list or you're on a subscription pass, uh, you you could find worse things to watch right now than Godzilla X-Kong, the new empire. Uh, plus, you got to see how Godzilla gets his his pink spikes. Okay, I'm mm-hmm. not going to give it away. I mean, but that is part of the movie. It did make that. I mean, it made a ton did of it? money. I think it made like 80 million in Hell the opening weekend. Hell yeah, so fellow moviegoers! It, it, it did really well. So all right, yeah. I mean, I I haven't seen Godzilla minus one. Oh, that Nick, that you. I'm telling you right now, you need to see because that is high art Godzilla. Like this is well, the way yeah, of saying. Yeah. Like that is no joke. It's it's almost like a real movie that a monster is just a part of. You know. Um, yeah. High quality. That that's much more like serious and in, in true Japanese tradition. Godzilla, where where this is more playing off of Godzilla twenty fourteen and everything that kind of sprung out of that. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that like so. I've seen the the most recent one, the the one that came before, like the Kong Godzilla one that's out now. I don't remember what it was j- called. Just Maybe Godzilla was... X Kong. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, the, the one that came out before that, I saw that. That's the one where they put Kong, where you said, on like in, in Hidden Earth or, or, or something like that. It wasn't bad. Um, I do think that the those movies since the new Skull Island have been pretty decent. Yeah, um, Yeah. so I'll probably watch it when it comes on like HBO Max or whichever streaming service it comes to after its theatrical run. There you go. Um, that's typically what I do with like, monster movie franchises or something like that yeah, you, and, you don't do the the movie sub anymore do you oh i do oh, yeah, I yeah do. you, you I just, just you like, still oh, can't God. tolerate shit like this even if it's part of your subscription <laughs> i just like if i'm gonna go like i don't go to the movies right. by myself so oh, like okay. if if like you got go hey man it's okay i've been doing it since <laughs> i was in my 30s almost completely solo since i had charlie and now she's kind of become my my movie buddy again because yeah she's it's going to be eight tomorrow, by the way. Kids fucking turning eight already, which is like crazy heart wrenching <laughs> to me. Uh, but, she, you know, she's old enough now that she can actually remember movies. It's funny. I mean, dude, she she forgets almost everything we, we watched, I'd say, until she was about four or five years old. It's just it's all been and we all, you know, us adults, we, we were familiar with that brain delete where you just all your memories from a certain age just kind of disappear. Uh, so she doesn't remember half the shit we used to watch, but she is getting to the point now where she can actually process shit and derive her own entertainment out of it. Although, if this little shithead makes me get up one more time in the middle of a movie I haven't seen yet for her to take a piss after I had her told her to take a piss before a movie, she's getting banned! She's getting <laughs> banned from Daddy That's Night definitely... Thursday early screening films, okay? That is definitely understandable for an eight-year-old, though. No, dude, she never <laughs> like... used to do this. Like, she's got an, like a, a, a champion-style bladder, and I even said, it's like, hey, you had to pee last time, so like Daddy does, and you always make fun of him, let's go pee before we go. And That's the thing, dude, she makes fun of me. Every time, because I'm like, no, I'm holding my pee until we get to the theater, and then I'm going to piss. And she's like, why? Just pee now. I'm like, no, you always pee at the movie theater. So walk her in. I'm in my own, you know, the men's. She comes out surprisingly early. I'm like, hey, you all right? You go? She's like, yeah, I'm good. But halfway in the movie, right when a major plot development's coming through. Hey, Dad, I got to pee. I'm like, What? What do you mean you got to pee? How bad? Can you hold it? And she's like, no, it's really bad. I didn't go fully the last time. Like, what do you mean you didn't go fully? You're not fucking four. Piss it out. Oh, <laughs> Obviously, I wasn't yelling like that. I'm, I'm playing it up for the show. Hey, hold on here. League of Extraordinary Sixers with the birthday donation for Charlie. Thank you, League. I think oh, one of our sweet. only female fans, if not the only female fan out there. So you're always... Linda. Uh, oh, yeah, Linda. That's right. I forgot Linda. Our, our two females out there. We appreciate you. And there's our boy B-Mad rolling in. Good to see you, brother. So, yeah, anyways, yes. there, there's my story on Godzilla Kong and, and taking kids to the theater. I don't, I don't know if we got a movie this week, but I think there's something interesting coming up in April uh, that I'll have to check out. Um, all right. Real quick here, you, you know, Nick, I, I can't believe it's been this long, but back in 2021, we first revealed to our audience that 
uh, I believe at the time it was As- Aspire or Asper or whatever, Spire, A S P Y R. Yeah, Aspire. Yeah, was Aspire, working yeah. on a, a KOTOR remake. Uh, yes. Not not just a remaster, but a a legitimate remake. The visuals is like what PS5 only that type of shit. That was back in 2021. It, it's already been three years since that story it is came crazy. out. Crazy and yeah, that it does not feel like that. Yeah, long. We, we've had nothing. We've had nothing come out. Of it. And you are right. Like pandemic has made time go by even faster. It, it really is like those two years are just they just poof the fuck away, and they're not even real anymore. But like you said, it, it's been few and far between on the updates. Uh, the reason for that, at one point in time, it was sold. Like literally, Aspire lost the property to uh, Saber Interactive. And now Saber Interactive has pulled out of its partnership with some other publisher development thing. So people are like, well, what's the hell? What's, what's going on? Does anyone still have rights to this KOTOR remake? Is it still being worked on? Are we ever going to get it? And uh, this week, Saber Interactive CEO has come out and said, hey, it's alive and well, people. Just don't ask me any other details. Mm-hmm. But yes, it's still a thing. Saber is, is working on us. It's clear and it's obvious that we're working on this. It's been in the press numerous times. What I will say is that the game is alive and well, and we're dedicated to making sure we exceed consumer expectations. So obviously you didn't get any other details out of that, Nick. And it's been three years <laughs> in development already. Um, so you, you don't know what the, what the sales delayed or how long it sat on back burners, but I, I wouldn't expect this to come out we think 26 maybe if we're lucky 2026 yeah I, I mean there were so many like over the past year of this game we've heard it's shelved it's back in development it switched developers from aspire right. to saber like and then saber got you know whatever got released from um in the Embracer Group, which the Embracer Group is a complete shit show of like... That, that's just, who it was, yeah. What, what are they, yeah. Nick? Is that just like a... Are they like an umbrella I mean, for a bunch of developers? Yeah. I mean, what they were, they were THQ. And then oh, after, okay. like, they, they like started to acquire all of these studios and then like changed their name from THQ to something else. And now they're the Embracer group. And as the Embracer group, they're just like a hellhole. Like they're, they're like a pit of despair for any fucking developer that, that is under their wing. Like for like Gearbox Entertainment, the, the studio that makes Borderlands was just uh, sold by Embracer group and they were bought by, by take two and, and, rockstar games in 2k so yeah i mean there's been a lot of i mean it's there's been a lot of questions around the kotor remake because of that like situation that it was in with like the developer changing and then it being under this embracer thing and then it being sold and then blah 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 all this other stuff so i know that the guy you know the the ceo of saber is uh saying like everybody knows it's in development but honestly like I don't think everybody <laughs> knew that. Like he says, it's clear and obvious that we're working on this, but honestly, there's been so I, much like news back yeah. and forth that we don't know. What like, was it? Was it last didn't. summer? Uh, it was a Jason Schreier, one of the, one of the bigger um, gaming journalists out there. I, I thought he was going around saying the shit was dead. Like, yeah. like DOA. So yeah, I mean, Hey, either way, there's there's really no other meat to spew at you all right now, but it, it's at least comforting to know that this game may may still happen. You know, we 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 haven't heard shit about Outlaws, and it was supposed to be out last week. Nothing, oh, yeah, like that's... no new trailers, and, and they they're still planning on releasing in 24. But I'm starting to get like, uh, okay, I mean, are we gonna start drumming up any sort of promo machine I mean... here? Or? They're probably just gonna wait until fall. late summer and then do, uh, yeah, like do. Well, a yeah, release you're right because the way the video game industry works, your your major drops are gonna be early in the year, right? Like February, March. Usually, you'll get big titles. Like I, I'm finally got to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Love Final Fantasy VII. I've loved it since I was 17 years old. I'll play anything that's set in that universe. 
And that was a March release. And then Nick is correct. You, you'll usually get a June, July big drop, like last year was Diablo 4. And then you come to the, the mega fall release, which essentially extends from October through November when you're going to get your, your, your God IPs like Call of Duties and, and Halos and whatnot. So, um, that, that you're, you're probably right. Probably summer, fall, if they want to capitalize on the holiday rush for that. Real quick, dude. <laughs> while while we were parsing through that uh, Kotor story, I saw on IGN sidebar that a new Matrix movie is in the works, and Drew Goddard is directing, Lana Wachowski EPing. So this will be the first Matrix film to not have a Wachowski in the director's chair. Uh, but mm-hmm. knowing Drew Goddard is on board, he did The Martian and The Cabin in the Woods. All right, I um yeah I can get down a, with that. That's a pretty solid choice. Uh, yeah, I, I saw that like right before we went live. Um, I, I mean, like I was, I was okay with, with resurrection, like the fourth matrix movie. I think that the action in that one was a little lackluster in comparison to the action yeah, in the other films. Our, our heroes were almost, what, almost 25 years older. Cause I think it was this past weekend was the 25th anniversary of matrix. And I'll yeah. never forget the first time I saw that in 99, I'm assuming Nick has a similar experience as most of you do. The first Matrix truly was a like one of those life changing moments in terms of what you should expect from cinema. And it yeah. changed everything. I mean, that 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 bullet time camera became overused. It's still overused to this day. Uh, but the story was just so fucking cool. It was such a complete film. And, you know, while two, three, and four have never lived up to one, it, it's still a worthwhile franchise that, yes, I would, I'll go see five, six, seven, and eight if they roll them out. Yeah, yeah, I'll happily go see that. And here's one thing about, and, and I don't know if, it, like, you know, if everybody knows this, or I don't know if, like, if I hallucinated this, but so when the matrix two released the matrix two and three only released like three months apart for those of you. Yeah. It was a spring fall kind of drop. Yeah. So the, the movies came out the same year. And like you said, it was like spring fall, but what I thought was really interesting was my friends and I went to go see the matrix two. We see the whole movie through and we just sit in the theater and we wait, like we wait through the whole credit sequence. And at the end of that credit sequence, there was a there was a stinger for the Matrix Three that teased the battle inside of the Matrix between all of the Smiths and in Neo, and I don't know if that was like the first time in like yeah, modern dude, that, history that has to be the first stinger ever. To yeah, set that like up. that happened because like we were sitting like we were literally sitting in that theater and like the people were coming and sweeping up around. We yeah. were the only ones left, and it was a late it was a late movie. We went to go see the midnight release and we're like, look, we're like, we'll just stay until the credits are over. Like, we're just going to hang out. And midnight releases, you remember ended, those, man, those are, those are long gone, both for gaming. Well, I don't know. I mean, well, no gaming. Now they just say, Hey, if you pre-order it, you can play it early. Right. That That's kind of what it is now. Yeah. That that's kind of what it is now is, you know, obviously the, the game stops of the world and the physical locations that you can get games from aren't, you know, as prevalent as right. they were, and they're definitely Dude, not was, doing midnight releases that was anymore. Fun though, man, but, that was like yeah. as as weird as it may sound to some of you. There was some, it was like just a, this. A, it was a fun community activity, I guess, to go sit at a random strip mall uh, late at night and wait for a, a, a game to release. Uh, but I was telling Charlie, I'm like, Charlie, we come to movies on Thursdays because the new movies come out one day early now. Uh, you used to, if you wanted to see a new movie, you either had to go at midnight on Thursday. And not get home till three in the morning or just wait until the Friday screening. So, yeah, I'm kind of glad all that stuff has, has gone away. Uh, I'm not not going to lie. But this is cool. I'm, I'm down. New Matrix, Drew Goddard directing. Wachowski still involved. So you're, you're going to have the, 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 the core voice of the franchise in there. <sighs> all right. Let's do some Star Wars time. Why don't we? Not Bad Batch yet. Don't worry. We're excited to talk. Nick's feeling good. I'm feeling good. We got the darkness infused back into the series that we've been lacking. And I already told him I've got a long list of, huh, to ask him because it is a lot of little, I felt like there's a lot of little nuggets that got dropped in that episode that if you weren't necessarily paying attention, you might have missed some potential telegraphing of future plot lines. But now, the Acolyte. 
All right, man. So, uh, Act Like Trailer came out a few weeks ago. So, it's Hype Machine is getting there. We're getting interviews every week. This week, EW did one with Daphne Keen, who is playing the new Padawan Jekka Lon in the Acolyte. She is Master Soul's Padawan. So, Li Zhengju, his, his character's Padawan. And uh, obviously played by uh, Weapon X-23. Uh, she was also in that, uh, I forget what it was called, but the, not Golden Compass, but Golden Compass, but on HBO, the series. Oh, uh, there's like three yeah, seasons of it. Yeah, there, there you go. There you go. Materials. We started watching that. It's not recently. bad, but it, it's kind of shitty. How's that? I got through it, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, yeah, you got to go watch it. How's that? Oh, hold on. Hold on. We got to recognize B Mad here dropping that support. Matrix was iconic, and I'm still waiting for a true Matrix game. Last minute release for me was Hunger Games. You know what? I was going to say, there was a game that came out that kind of tied into Matrix 2 yeah, starring it, Niobe, right? Yeah, it was... Um, I can't remember the name. Of, enter the, was it, yeah, I it think was Enter the, the Matrix. Matrix. And it, I think it was Enter From the what Matrix, I remember, it yeah. wasn't, wasn't half bad, and it, its canon is legit and actually kind of informed you on the events in Matrix 2 and 3. Um, so yeah, there's some old yeah, ones be mad was pretty good but uh yeah it like yeah that one like showed you how to or like it showed the power plant which like you only hear about right. in in the in the movies like this power plant was destroyed and that's what enabled a lot of the uh like the stuff that's happening in the second and third movies like that game essentially leads you up to like how this power plant got destroyed and like how you go about doing it as ghost and niobe oh that's that's the other thing bats bringing up and and at times nick i i almost thought the animatrix was better than the matrix uh the animatrix it's a collection it's an anthology of animated shorts some of them are prequel based that show how the machines took over and why Mm -hmm. they did Mm -hmm. others like uh it's something like the last flight of the osiris again lead right into matrix 2 i believe or matrix 3 uh yeah good one there bat animatrix is fucking tits now that i think about it especially if you like yeah, that animatrix you know that, that that anime type of animation <laughs> what a stupid statement uh, <laughs> all right so star wars time here so, like I said, EW did a did a did a piece on Jackie Lon. We got some new images there, so you can really kind of see her. Uh, and I did learn, Nick, she's not full Thelen. She's half Thelen, half human. Um, but her her Thelen DNA has given her spikes on her head, kind of that washed out looking face. But um, I, I think this this Jedi looks freaking rad. Okay, we we yeah, don't get the cool character design. I know in the prequels there there are alien Jedi, but they're they're mostly background fodder. They're not necessarily in the limelight outside of Yoda. But you know, come on, I mean, he's mostly humanoid and feels like a human anyways, even though he's a extremely short green guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I I dig this. I I, I dig kind of infusing an alien in the main cast of uh of this show and you know obviously she she's going to be a main player being soul's padawan so she'll be probably going on all these missions and providing a, an interesting perspective right because she she is a padawan so like she says here we're going to learn a bit about this padawan and, and how she may be portrayed in the show so you know ew asked her about you know who, who is jackie lon and um she goes into, well, hey, I'm, I'm excited that we know her name now because we had to keep it secret for so long. And I'm very happy that I get to say that she's an alien and that she's a Padawan and that she's a Jedi. She's a mixed species, part Thelen, part human. She's very cool. And I have some very cool fights I do with the lightsaber. I really love her. She's a great character and was really fun to play. I'm very excited that the trailer came out. I was buzzing for days. So, yeah, not a lot there outside of her, her species and that she's going to be in some action scenes. Um, but th- this one could be a bit insightful here, Nick. She talks about the relationship between Jackie and Soul. So mm-hmm. she describes Jackie as, I- I'd say she is a very 
dedicated Padawan. She's definitely in awe of him in a very kind of sweet way. She thinks the absolute world of him in a way that I think they have a very sweet relationship, but she's much more aware of the authority difference than, for example, Obi-Wan and Anakin. She's very much like, no, he's the master and I'm the Padawan and he's perfect. And everything he says, I have to follow to the T. And that's what I was saying. That right there, Nick, I think is going to provide a very interesting portrayal of a of a jedi padawan that we necessarily haven't seen on the screen where they truly are going to be like a yes sir how high sir what's next (laughs) sir you know what i mean and and i like that she kind of contrasted it with obi-wan anakin which was probably one of the more contentious master padawan relationships that the jedi order faced so i i think this is cool and i'm interested to see kind of where this is going to go is is is, is she going to be overly influenced by him and possibly follow bad advice and skip out on something that could save the day or is she going to learn like hey i need to maybe start not buying into him so much or is the lesson yeah you you learn for the master until you grow on into a knight and then you kind of set your own tone yeah i think it's going to be interesting to see how the dynamic plays you know i cuz what we know is that this show is going to involve some amount of, you know, like group travel with Jedi, yeah. you know, they're, they're going to explore like this, these outer rim areas and, and other things like that, explore potential threats. So she is probably going to be that character. Like we've seen in so many other properties where it's like, Oh, we can't do that because that's, that's against the Jedi way or, you know, like this is, that's that you know we can't exactly. do that because Master Soul yeah. said we can't yeah. do that and stuff. So the goody two you'll shoes, probably right? Have, like she almost yeah, might like annoy. Do you think she's going to annoy some of her other traveling partners? Possibly. I'm I'm sure she will. I'm sure she will. Or she'll just be kind of looked at as like the teacher's pet yeah. type of deal. You know, like oh well, we can't we can't do anything like that because uh, you know because she's around because. You know, she's just going to go and, and run and tell Master Soul if we do something that that he said not to do. Or yeah, that we're not yeah, supposed yeah. That's kind of so. what I was getting at. Like, I, I think this character in her complete allegiance to Soul is going to offer up some very interesting story points. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, I definitely agree with that. All right. Yeah, yeah. Be mad. I mean, uh, be mad here in the chat saying that one part of the Star Wars fans seem to really want this to fail. Yeah, I've. I've noticed in particular that they're they're really coming out with their pitchforks for this one. And and we all know why. We're not going to go into it. It's stupid. We get into it every week. It makes me fucking angry because for the most part, I think humanity is awful. And most people just need to stay in their basements and stop breathing. Um, but yeah, there, this, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm aware of it. I don't actively seek it out, but because I do create star Wars content on a daily basis, I open myself up to get punched in the face. And we, I did start uh, sharing some of our acolyte content this week and instantly it's, which, which is kind of good for us because it, it drives the views, but most of the discourse on the, in the comment section is, Either, you know, we're shill assholes, we don't know Star Wars from our assholes, uh, this is already going to fail, quit pretending that you like it, you know, basically trying to project their hate into our heads. Um, but yeah, it, it's just like, whatever, we got to stop focusing on these assholes or worrying about them. It's going to happen with every new project. Mark Hamill himself could come out and and say, I'm making a Luke Skywalker trilogy and the same people would find ways to hate it. It's just, it's over. Like they exist to hate Star Wars. We exist to celebrate it and try to enjoy this fake science fiction based fantasy universe. Okay. All right. Fuck them. You can just guarantee now, anytime Disney announces something Star Wars, those people are not going to like it because they're fucking stupid, all right? Our, our video we put out proving that Star Wars Theory is a moron is doing quite well. It was great. <laughs> it was, I, I, you know, I added Ki, Ki Adimundi in there saying the line. We got Nick dropping truth on people with clips. It's beautiful shit. Check out our content. It's gotten a lot fucking better. I know no one looks at it or shares it or cares about it. But it's no longer just our two asses talking. You know, we 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 give you visuals to complement the words. All right, check it out: YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, 
Speaking of Instagram, Nick and I are getting ready to just nuke that motherfucker. And then when the government takes away TikTok, we'll just be down to YouTube. So <laughs> <laughs> have fun following us, StarWarsTime.net. Anyways, here she is. We get a new shot of her. She's a greenie, Nick. She's, she's sporting a green. I think it looks great. You know, Daphne yeah. is, she's got to be in her 20s now, maybe mid-20s. She just, she still looks like a little, a little tiny person, you know what I mean? But I am expecting her to be quite efficient in the action scenes. She based is on... not 20 yet. She is 19. No shit. All right. Well. Yeah. She was born 2005, January 2005. Wow. Um, but yeah, I'm expecting her to not be quite Yoda-like with a blade, but I could see her being very quick and possibly gymnast like with her blade um so I, I would like to i would like to i can't wait to see some of her action moments here yeah i mean i'm that is one thing that i'm very interested in seeing just in general in this show is is lightsaber combat because if we think about the three er eras of star wars that we've seen thus far it is you know the prequel trilogy the grand republic has incredibly fast and acrobatic lightsaber combat because of you know, many unbroken years of training and passing down techniques and and just honing those skills over long periods of time. Then you have the OT where the lightsaber combat that we see is is very minimal. Like obviously whack, whack. that's just whack, whack. you know, <laughs> due to the, <laughs> the time period it was made in in the real world, you know, like made in the nineteen seventies. Well, no, no. I, I kinda 1980s, like I don't know so. if anyone picked up on what you said, but I I'll buy into it. it it's like there was an unbroken line of Jedi, you know, Jedi training Padawan, Jedi training Padawan, all the yeah. way up to the prequels. Then all the Jedi were genocided, so you yeah, you, so you those, lose those those training routines. So yeah, Nick, that's why. Yeah. Even though Darth yeah. Vader learned as a, and he was quite well, Vader, proficient. Yeah, I mean, Vader himself has obviously <laughs> gone through a massive transformation well, yeah. since the end of the prequel trilogy. His his body is basically Please. all. Robotic. You, you open a comic but, I mean, book. This, this guy's like taking planets down by himself. Like, come on, he ain't he ain't lumbering <laughs> so, around because of his mechanical legs. You are you are yeah. correct. It's a combination of I like your theory. We'll, we'll run with that. Lose. Well, also that's what Nick Gallard said there you go. Like, when so, we hey. interviewed Nick. Like Nick was that <laughs> that was his justification was that you've had this art that was honed over right. thousands of years very easily by the Jedi. And then the, in the OT, all of the masters have been killed and nobody's been trained in lightsaber combat for 30 years or so. Yeah. And so, Obi-Wan's been sleeping in a fucking cave feeling bad for himself. So it, it's yeah. not like he, he quite had his skills and we all know he was on that, that spice crack in age 30 years and 10. Yeah. So I would really like to see what the combat looks like in the acolyte because it's still in that era of like, hey, these people have been training in lightsaber combat for, you know, for hundred for centuries, unbroken. You have all of this knowledge and expertise passed down from master to apprentice in a very safe and environment. So I wonder if they will move a little bit more towards faster paced combat or if it will stay a little bit, you know, slower yeah, like we've seen in, in other. You know, because Leslie told us, she's like, listen, these Jedi rarely would have to wield their saber because they never felt threatened. Yeah. So, Nick, you could almost argue that maybe they're not even as proficient as our Galactic Republic Jedi because those Jedi yeah. were being asked to kind of keep peace versus explore like these ones. So, I could almost see the High Republic being a blend, almost almost like a ballet, where it's it's very smooth but methodical, like a dance. It, it's not going to be plotting yeah. like the OT. I don't think it's going to be frenetic like the prequel trilogy. I think it's going to be a mix where it's going to be it's going to flow, almost like like Tai Chi based on a uh, sped up, if that makes sense to people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that definitely fits in line with what we've heard from Leslie in previous interviews, how, you know, she's based the combat styles and the fighting styles a lot off of like Wushu yeah. and, and like that style of fighting, which is a little bit more, it, it is, it, it, it's not as frenetic, but it's also like very methodical exactly. and it's very thought out. Well, I mean, so, League, yeah. League here is making a good point, but were they training for war though? No, these Jedi were not. These Jedi saw no yeah. war. I mean, from what we're being told in the High Republic, I mean, yeah, that you might have had to, to put down some Nihil shit and the Drang gear here and there, but there was no galactic conflict going on at this point in time. 
unlike our, you know, when, when Ahsoka comes into the program, she truly is a child warrior, as, you know, it was expertly kind of portrayed again here in, in Ahsoka last fall. Uh, all right, uh, blah, blah, blah. How character makeup affect her performance? Who cares? Mm-hmm. Um, it, th- this was kind of interesting, though. Uh, she she talks about like yeah when I when I actually put the makeup on versus just reading the script she describes like I I initially thought she was going to be really methodical and cold and calculated and then as soon as I was in that makeup she became much more still methodical and a perfectionist and high achiever but with much more of an ingenuity and a curiosity and a true love for the craft that is being a Jedi. Which is really interesting because I am someone who moves their eyebrows a lot and not having eyebrows completely changes the expression on your face and not having eyebrows gave me sort of sweeter appearance, which completely changed the character in a way. So, yeah, she's, she's kind of confirming that, that, yeah, she is, she just loves being a Jedi and she's going to be that, yes, yes, Master Soul. What next, Master Soul? Can I do something else for you, Master Soul? You know, and I, I, it's going to be a, it sounds like a different type of, of Padawan that we've seen. Yeah, I mean, this is somebody like we've only ever really followed as a Padawan, Anakin Skywalker and bitchy Obi Wan. They're both they were both bitchy Padawans. <laughs> but even like even Ahsoka, like Ahsoka was a Padawan that was also very rebellious. Right. I mean, even like Luke Skywalker when he was training yep. under Yoda, right. he was always complaining. Even um, uh, oh, gosh, like. I mean, we've seen some others as well, like through through cartoon series and Ezra, stuff like that. I mean, Sabine, Sabine, Ezra, Sabine, it, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, they were all very, yeah, all, all the you know, all the Boken say, Jedi are shitheads, essentially. Yeah, like they, they're all like, well, why do I have to do it this way? And blah blah blah, and all this other stuff, and like you got to read like, the books. Yeah. You know, so I think that this is probably yeah. I mean, like you said, this is probably the first time that we'll ever see a Jedi. Padawan or trainee that's like, yes, master, I'll do it this way. This is, yep, just no problems. Like, I mean, no dude, issues. Honestly, it sounds like the first time we're going to see a Jedi that wants to be a Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, most of these people are essentially what we saw in Bad Batch today, except a bounty hunter didn't show up to collect them. The Jedi Order did. What's the difference? Yeah. Yeah. What's the difference? I mean, I mean yeah, I guess, you know, the Empire's locking them up in a fucking sterile room and, and stabbing them every day. But, you know, they're, they're still taking them from their family never to be seen again and locked up in a temple. Uh, yeah. Dig it. All right. I mean, it will be a fun <laughs> archetype to follow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we've, we, we've seen a lot of uh, rebellious Jedi in the past. So time to see one that, like, actually follows. It, it will. It will be funny. And, and I have a feeling Jackie is going to be a standout in addition to Indara. Although I'm, I'm kind of with you. I Sadly, I think Indara is going to get taken out early. And maybe we'll kind of get some more of her and potential flashbacks. Um, but... That there's a lot of these Jedi. I'm already like, yes, I can't, I, I can't wait to meet you. I really, I can't wait to meet you. And, and Jackie's up there, and Dara's up there. I'm gonna hold my 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 reservations on on the other ones. The one guy, I forget his name, Yondo or Yondor. He kind of sounds like a dork. Uh, the Wookie Jedi, of course. I mean, come on. It's seen a Wookie run around with the laser <laughs> sword that's not animated and fully grown. All for it. Uh, what else she got in here? Uh, she talked a little bit about Leslie. And, you know, it's like, hey, whatever. Everyone here, we we all buy into Leslie, but but this is the type of stuff I wish the the haters would just allow their stupid brains to process. When when you hear the way that this employee of Leslie's talk about her, you can only guess that the work being done was at a high level, and that everyone else kind of felt the same way, which usually results in a great product, but. Um, you know, talking about how Leslie helped influence Jackie, she says, Leslie is one of the most amazing people I've ever worked with. She's such an interesting director in the sense that she has an innate trust with actors and her crew that it makes you trust her more. She's so confident in the people she's hiring, and she has such a broad understanding of Star Wars and of cinema in general that I truly feel like I would follow that woman to the trenches, Okay. That is a sign of a good leader. Good leaders are yeah. hard to come by, okay? I, I am struggling with that right now in my real life. I, Same. <laughs> I, yes, Nick and I both lack good leadership in our respective 
careers and it can make your life miserable. Uh, so that that paragraph right there, that to me is is really all. I, not that I needed convincing, but that just that just reinforces my expectations that this series is going to kick ass. Um, you know, she goes on to talk about how Leslie would would bounce ideas off of her, uh, but then like, no, you, hey, listen, this is kind of what I was thinking, but I want to see how you want to portray it. Um, so you know, Jackie both influenced by Leslie and of course. Daphne, uh, and it just yeah. like everything I, I keep reading about this, Nick. It's just like, yeah, let, let's go. I, I know we're never going to convince the trolls that, yeah, this is going to be worth your time, even if it's excellent. They'll still tell themselves that they hate it. Uh, but I'm excited for people like you and I and some of the fandos up in this bitch uh, to get this brand new style of Star Wars storytelling come June four. Yeah, I, I'm. I said this like a year ago or, or right around when this show was first announced. Like this has always been my, like one of my most anticipated things to come out of star Wars, even above the movies and above everything else, because it truly is a departure from the, from what we're used to. It's, it's a departure from the eras that we've been, you know, functioning in for the past, you know, 40 years at this point, 40 plus years at this point, we're getting new characters, we're getting new timelines, we're getting new settings, and and we're just getting to explore an area of the Star Wars universe that we haven't really been able to explore before, and that's really exciting for me. And I think that with the leadership and with the collaborative kind of storytelling that's going on here, I think that this is a, you know, it's, it's setting up to be something that's really special. Um, and yeah, I, I really hope that People give it a chance. If you're one of those people who are on the fence and they're like, oh, I'm not sure. Like, I really do feel like this is going to be a very pleasant surprise and and something that can really open up new doors for the Star Wars franchise in a way that even stuff like The Mandalorian ultimately couldn't, you know, because The Mandalorian ultimately fell back mm-hmm. into well, like, let's let's just use the characters that we're used to seeing. Let's just, you know, like... It's in the timeline, brother. If, it, so, if it's in that timeline, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's beholden to the saga tropes. Yeah. Just, it is so what it I, is. I think that yeah, yeah, and this is a good opportunity. I just, for those of you out there, even if you're not a moron fan and you're really like, hey, I just, I just, I don't want to watch it. I don't like, I don't like what it looks, just, just watch an episode. Like, I, I've never understood this with humans where they'll, they'll watch a trailer and be like, oh, it, garbage, fuck it. I can already tell it's complete trash. I hate it. It's like, how, how, please, please. I like, yeah, just, just go watch it. You probably already pay for Disney Plus, so it's not, you know, what it, what, it, what is your boycott honestly doing besides just making you look like a petulant child over, you know, uh, Disney, Star Wars, women, Kathy Kennedy, they they put trans people in there. Let me go down the basement and make love to my sister. Did you see the report that, you know, because of all these DNA tests, that there is way more incest in this country than anyone ever thought? I have not seen that, but... Yeah, I don't even know where I would have seen that. Does that even, <laughs> you know what's crazy? It doesn't surprise me though. Like, and this is going to get me in trouble. We do have the South, okay? Like, we do have the South. All right. Bad Batch time, I think. Bad Batch time. Two episode drop. Oh boy. And were they, you know, I mean, you know, last week, listen. Asajj back, great. Outside of that, it was it was Pabu Part Two. Not really, nothing was moved forward. In fact, we all felt like it it just made things a bit more confusing for fans that have a hard time understanding exactly what's happening with Omega, M Count, Force Sensitivity, so on and so forth. Well, there no no bullshit this week, young Nick. Uh, yes. Both in Identity Crisis and then right in the Point of No Return. I mean, we got everything we were mostly asking for over the past few weeks. When the series kind of dipped away from the Imperial narrative, in particular Hemlock and Tantus. And, you know, we, we, we returned in full force. Uh, as always, we're going to go here and just kind of give our thoughts on the episodes. Nick gets to go first because, you know, all the thousands of people that follow us have already watched my review that's been out there since about 10 o'clock this morning. So you kind of got my 
uh, a tease of my uh, feelings and, and breakdown points for this episode. So, Nick, without further ado, mm-hmm. what say you about point of... Oh, first, we did all right on our prediction. It was, yeah, it was quasi-close. Yeah. The, the only thing we kind of fucked up was the identity. We thought that was going to revolve around Clone X, where in turn it actually was Dr. Carr or Emery. Um, yeah. But we did call this was going to be the Pabu Blast. And I know at one point in time, one of our dumbasses said, Omega is probably going to willingly get caught. So here we go. Yeah. So hold on. Yeah. Let, let them all start clapping. We can't hear <laughs> you. Hello. Come on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank there you. We thank go. you. <laughs> uh, go ahead, man. What did yeah. you think about this double dip? I thought it was really good. I really do think that after the the off episode that, in, in my opinion, the off episode from last week, this one rebounded really, or this double drop rebounded very well. It gave us what we've been asking for for a while, which is a check back in with the Imperial side of things, finally understanding like what's going on over there. Um, and then it, it, like you said, it kind of helps push some of our speculation a little bit closer towards actually happening. You know, the the episode one, the identity crisis centered around Emery Carr, like you said, is really kind of now moving more towards that narrative point that we had speculated on about her being the one to really disrupt the operations within uh within Mount Tantis and potentially set off this, this order 99 that we had, that we had come up with. Um, I thought that that identity crisis was like a heartbreaking episode to watch. Honestly, like it was, it was really tough to watch, you know, these kids being experimented on lied to stolen from their families and, and essentially just, you know, become blood like, you know, they're essentially like the, like the vampiric, like blood, you know, blood bags or whatever, (laughs) you know, they're, they're just here to give their, their blood for tests and see if they're viable specimens for, for project necromancer. And, and just seeing how Emery was coping with that once she was put in charge of it was really interesting. You know, I think that, that Emery's character in this one episode has made a lot of progress and now we have a much deeper understanding of where her head is in terms of you know her loyalty to the empire not only just to the empire but but to hemlock and 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 this whole uh this whole experimentation that's going on at mount tantus so i think that identity crisis was an incredible episode even though it was relatively limited in terms of its scope i think it answered a lot of questions and and furthered the narrative points um, inside of Mount Tantus a great amount. Um, So I really enjoyed that episode, even though, like I said, for me, it was like heartbreaking to watch like these kids being kidnapped from their parents and, and dropped off at this facility just to be essentially bled out. It's the empire pretending that they're the Jedi order. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's literally these, we know they're, they're, they're force users. They're force sensitive. And like Nick said, they, they just become guinea pigs to use their blood to see if they can get it to recreate in a clone vessel. Um, yeah. yeah. And then also within this episode, we got the clarification for those of you. I mean, you may have missed it because it wasn't super, you know, clear, but in the conversations with Hemlock in Emery, I, I wrote it Hemlock down. Says, I wrote it down. That Omega's blood is the binding agent to help the high M count blood okay. fuse. Okay, I, I, I can always rely on Nick. I never have to worry about Nick <laughs> watching Star Wars stupid. But I, 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 I too, Nick picked up on this line and made sure I wrote it down verbatim because you are yeah. right. It is important. All right, here we go. As you know, M count can't be directly replicated from the source, meaning you can't just take Palpatine's jizz and plop it into a clone, okay? Nala Say knew of another way. Omega's blood is the only one compatible to recreate the M count levels. There you go. So there you go. Yes. Her blood is is essentially 
the binding agent. And I, I do believe that they use that term binding agent at some point in, in that episode as well, is the binding agent for the M count blood that they're getting from these children now, because all of like, like uh, Hemlock said, all of the adult specimens are, are essentially wiped out. Like he, he said that in the episode as well. So they're getting this high M count Nick, blood from how these did children. that happen? I wonder how that happened. That there's Some this guy named Darth Vader, 66, maybe, and, and, and the know. Inquisitorius. <laughs> yeah, like so, so, so much of this is happening. But, um, but yeah. So now we have the full picture. There, they are these these M count bounties are actually coming in on children. Like we saw <laughs> Cad, like you know the the introduction of Cad Bane into this uh, season again goes and in and, and kidnaps a, a, a force sensitive child brings it back to Tantus and everything that happens there so we know how they're getting the M count blood now it's from children that are being as fucked up as it sounds they're children being reported to the Empire by citizens oh yeah of, of the galaxy it's and then uh, using that blood along with the binding agent from from Omega's blood once she's back in is is what their hopes you know in in their hopes and dreams is what's going to have Project Necromancer really uh, come to full fruition. Um, so I thought that that was super important for for those of us out there who are confused about like well what how is this working is Omega Force sensitive well, here's what, the like, only what's the, the because the, I'm a goofball. When uh, Emery is starting to feel like a complete monster piece of shit, and, and she's kind of sitting in her lab, she's looking at the the data pads of the other Force children. I don't know if you noticed, but Omega's blood sample match theirs identically in terms of okay, like well. there's Force shit in there. Point being, Nick, she still Nala say somehow was able to get force into a clone so yes like you said there's still something special about it's not that she has the force it's that as a clone she was able to accept force yeah she like got the got the midichlorians Mm -hmm. to bind with her blood and that's how she knows that omega is is the is the blood that they need to get this binding to get the m count with the blood and all the other shit so um anyway yeah i mean i was a huge i was a huge fan of that episode i think it really gave us some important updates on all the stuff that we were interested in um we also got to see um you know essentially requisitions officers come to to hemlock and be like hey what do you need all this money for he's like don't worry about what i need the money for it's already been approved so give me the fucking money uh you know obviously that was tarkin's little uh, oh, little don't worry. Brief cameo. We're, we're going to talk about him because he, he just still confuses the living shit out of me. And his frugality is just, it's mind boggling. It is. It's <laughs> like, so weird. Yeah. Like he's, he's over here pension yeah, pennies and Hemlock's like, look, just give him head account. Give me the fucking money. Yeah. He's like, yeah. Why, why, why yeah. did he want to become grand moff? He should just became like the grand poobah of finance. Cause clearly that yeah, is his favorite thing about being in an empire finance minister and then yeah on, on to point of no return i mean point of no return was obviously very a very straightforward episode we finally figured out how clone x was able to track down Sid, the you the shithead so yeah i mean that that's unfortunate we all picked up um, on that right when he said the transdotion talked okay yeah yes so uh now we know how hopefully how she's he dead got there right is sid dead did he kill her hopefully I mean, if anybody deserves an off-screen uh, death, uh, it's that shit. Yeah, an off-screen dick. death. <laughs> it definitely this is. This is, is twice for... now. She's ultimately led to Omega ending up at Tantus, and uh, now she's responsible for the lovely, peaceful island of Pabu becoming a wasteland. Yeah. So, um, like I said, it was a pretty straightforward episode. Once they got on, like once Clone X got on to Pabu, it was essentially just like a hey imperials are here we have to try to get out in the best way that we can they get taken they essentially get taken out one by one i mean between wrecker and then hunter and then it does kind of come down to that final two our tantus two between omega and and crosshair and omega has to be the one to tell him like look this is the only way i have to give myself up i have to get recaptured in order to get there and then he blows it um and then he blows it <laughs> and then he blows it. 
Uh, he misses the shot on the tracker beacon and, and now it is really a, a big question mark of how are they going to get back there unless, you know, Omega has a, like a second hidden transponder device on her person because not like the, the, the TK unit that took her, her transmitter didn't make it back on to the ship. So that transmitter has gone. There's no transmitter device that Crosshair was able to successfully get onto the ship. So that's that's out. So now Omega is gone with no reliable way to track her. Um, but that is one of our pieces of speculation that I had thrown out way like way early and that I started to kind of waver on in the last episode. I even said I was like, I, you know, we're running out of time for Omega to be recaptured, which is... We did you know, call the, that, though. We, we called she would we did. probably... We knowing her, she would it. fall on the sword. I mean, I'm at this point, dude, I think I said it last week, it's going it, to be rough, but I, I could almost see Omega being the sacrificial lamb for the bros. I mean, she's always the one willing to take the most heat for the family. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be. It could be. But now we are in this interesting position where it's like wreckers fucked up mm -hmm. like hopefully he can recover you know hunter do you think hunter's gonna take it, it out on crosshair or is, is he gonna understand that like yeah he wasn't gonna stop omega period yeah i think he knows well enough that like how omega is and and exactly what she's trying to do so i'm sure that there will be a little bit of of anger towards crosshair initially because of you know the uh, like just how everything went down and you know, there's going to be like tensions are going to be running high because a lot of the batch members are in bad spots now. But I think ultimately Hunter knows in his person that there was nothing that he could do about they, they know, were screwed. Or no, nothing that either of yeah, them they, could they, do. They were about screwed. It. Like, I mean, that, like you said, clone X learned from the last time. I mean, they, the, the empire had this thing locked down. They, they had no chance. I mean, as soon as he, yeah. as soon as, like you said, as soon as he got there and spotted them, we had a, a cruiser overboard, multiple gunships coming out, blowing up every means of escape. Uh, there was no way out. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, Hunter would be like, hey, what, what, what the fuck? Why would you listen to a kid? And Crosshair's going to be like, really, dude? You, you live with her longer than I did. There's no, I no mean, stopping her. They also knew, too, at a certain point that, like, if, if they were going to keep holding out, then the populace was going to suffer. Like, they're – like. Clone X and the Empire is not going to sit there. Dude, they're and be getting like, ready well, to flamethrow fucking houses just to do it. Yeah, yeah. So like, it, it, it was basically like, do you want to keep hiding and just let them kill these civilians, or do you turn yourself in? And the obvious answer was, you you know, Omega had to turn herself in to really put herself in a position to save not only her brothers in the batch, but also save the populace of Pabu. And I think she, you know, that, that was very clear. Um, clearly yeah, the only way that they could to death anyways, it. cause they've lost their livelihood, no more skiffs to fish. So hopefully you can grab a few tasty morsels right there off the dock. Uh, yeah, once you know, again, got to rebuild <laughs> for sure. Once again, clone force 99 has left a safe haven in ashes. Uh, Johnny asking here, you, you think they hunt Bane for help? I don't know. I I, I think that might have been Bane's only only appear, appearance this year or this season. But possibly. I mean, he, he does know that people from Tantus show up on that space station, which they, they still didn't name that station, Nick. It's clearly in orbit around Coruscant. There was Republic cruisers docked on it. Uh, but yeah, nothing, it, it wasn't named in captions or anything. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, Fennec could, could give him a lead. Uh, I think next week is Juggernaut. So I'm assuming that's going to be the opening shot of the trailer. Uh, you know, yeah. where, where Fee's on the mission with them doing God knows what, probably trying to find some intel on something, but, um, what's Sixer saying here? I thought what Bane said to Emery was very interesting, almost like telling her, not the time. Call me later. I, I no. Nah, I I I picked up on that more. Like you better be careful, Emery, because the questions you're you're answering are gonna get your ass in trouble with your own bosses. Type yeah. Of thing. Yeah. Because it like Bane's not a good guy. Is, like Bane is. No. It, and it's funny if you remember what Bane says to Boba in the Book of Boba Fett. They're like, "Hey, he used to work for the Empire. Look what this cunt's doing." 
Yeah. He's yeah. he's I mean this stealing literal babies from their mothers. Yeah. For money. So it's it's not a good situation. From a certain for point sure. of view, Mr. Bain. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> It's not a good situation for sure, and I and I really don't think that the batch is gonna reach out to him because like they've they've had too many bad run-ins with him. Like he's never been like a you know like a like a friendly type of person towards them, even if it was you know just for a job or something like that. They're probably gonna go you know pretend like maybe they'll try to reach back out to. To Asajj, maybe they'll try to reach, you know, deeper into the the bounty hunter community to see if they can get any sort of leads. But I don't think that they're. Yeah, I mean, now that you bring her up, and I I still don't necessarily foresee her coming back this season. But Asajj makes the most sense at this point because they at least know, like, all right, Asajj knows way more about Omega's potential latent force abilities than us. She has already offered, like, hey, I may have to take her anyways to train. Uh, and knowing that Asajj has some level of care for Omega, they'd be like, all right, well, maybe we can, maybe she's heard something. She found us on Pabu, so what else could she possibly track down? I honestly, Nick, I, I think they're going to have to go to Rex and Echo to see what progress they've made on their search for Tantus, and that that's possibly what's going to lead them on this juggernaut mission, but clearly we're not there yet. I haven't even talked about what I think about these episodes. And, you know, really, there's not much to say. I did my full review. You can go check it out seven minutes long and cut them down a bit. Uh, but like young Nick, I, I I love these episodes. I mean, the identity crisis, very dark, very uh, evil. It, it just a, a great yeah. portrayal of how horrendous the Empire was, even this early in its reign. I mean, like, like mm-hmm. you said, the stuff with the with the kids, just keeping them locked up. And the fact that Hemlock admits, like, yeah, you know, outside of not having a ton of adults, you know, the ones down in the vault. I don't know if anyone picked up on that, but the vault. No, the vault was the kids. The sub, the, the, the sub level, I believe, is what we saw him and Palpatine in, and and yes, I think those yes. are the the Jedi locked up in in stasis or whatnot. Um, but he, like you said, man, he's like, hey, listen, they're just more pliable. They they don't bitch as much. They don't resist. I mean, just think of how innately evil that line of thinking is. Like I, I can, it's easier to get what I want because I can physically and mentally manipulate a small child. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it was like heartbreaking hearing these kids saying like, "Hey, yeah, I mean, they said they told us that we would be able to go back home. I just want to go back home. Can I like it would like." And like you said, it's evil. And and usually when we see evil in Star Wars, it's like Darth Vader, this hulking figure that's 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 killing these people, you know, offhand with no care, or you know, the destruction of the Jedi Temple, and it's like very outwardly evil. This may be the most evil thing we've ever seen in Star Wars. Like the the kidnapping imprisonment and and bloodletting of children and 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 just lying to them the whole mm-hmm. time like locking yeah, them up was, like putting them in solitary yeah. if they try to escape for two months yeah. <laughs> i mean it is it is absolutely one of the most sinister and evil things that we've seen in Star yeah, Wars history, it, in my opinion. It, dude, it, in my opinion. it's a good thing it was done in animated form because in, in live action, it would have been even more jarring and, and disturbing. It really is. It's like, whoa. Uh, I mean, I'm as I clipped out my my review today, Opus identified a clip and the way I'm, I'm kind of titling it is, is Hemlock more twisted than Palpatine himself? Uh, I mean... Palpatine, he's he's God level boss. He doesn't know the day to day shit. He doesn't know Hemlock's rounding up kids to do this. Not not listen. I I know Palpatine could give two shits. Uh, yeah, is uh, yeah yeah. But Hemlock is a very very twisted individual. I mean, he was so twisted he got kicked out of the Republic Science Corps. Like he's just he's mm-hmm. not right mm-hmm. in the head. Uh, we got some comments here on an address. Be mad. Should I give up hope that the batch is related to Grogu's rescue? Yes. Uh, Keller and Beck, yeah. we at least know, at least got him off a of Coruscant. There's absolutely no reason at this point in time for Grogu to be involved, but they definitely owe us at least another flashback or two to show 
how Grogu ends up with a band of Nictos. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that any more Grogu related story is probably going to be pushed off to Mando specific properties. I, I doubt that we're even going to get it in Ahsoka. So we might just like Grogu's rescue story might just be relegated to the film. I, I mean, uh, because listen, there is potential with these M count bounties. You, you would think Grogu would be yeah, on that good. bounty list. And maybe that's why he does end up with CD mofos many decades down the road here. But yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah. L- listen, be mad. Nick and I, we're, we've been high on that theory since bad batch season one. It's just, it ain't, it ain't panning out. We're, we're going to have a laser focus now on clearly when is Emery going to finally figure shit out and have her change of heart that Nick predicted before the season even began? Order 99 for life right here. SWTS get some. And what's the ultimate fate of the heroes? That's really where we're at yeah. at this point in time. If we're going to come across Grogu and, and look, I kind of had that thought too in this episode because when they put that kid, that little, you know, that, that I, kid I got it that right Bane, here, man. It's like Grogu's pram, right? Yeah, yeah, it looks Same just shit. like it. I mean, boxier, like, like the shape, yeah, it's boxier. Yeah, the so, yeah, that that's the only thing. But it's it, it like the shape is different, but it's the same transportation device. And I thought too, I was like, well, are we going to potentially come across something just by happenstance? Like, you know, if 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 they do reach back out to the bounty hunters guild, like, do they just happen to come across? A, a bounty hunter that is in the process of of, yeah. of collecting a, a pram that looks just like Grogu's maybe, or or like seeing like like by off chance this kid being transported somewhere, but I don't think that they are going to be directly involved in his rescue operations. If anything, it'll be like a passing kind of circumstance. Is is what I think, um, because I do I do think that at this point in the season it would kind of be a like a course uh correction to yeah to it just go it and just find doesn't make Grogu. sense i mean like you said the best the best path if they did did do it would be a almost like a an easter egg type of thing or, yeah, or a casual yeah, reference that. something on a hollow something on a puck but not a a main storyline um, I don't. I don't mind this theory. From this is the way they're getting up there on next week. He said, "If you watch the trailer, it looks like Wrecker's carrying someone with a skirt in the scene with the big truck coming up." I hate to say it, but it looks like Sid. Hey, you never know. I mean, that she she was contacted by Clone X. You, you never know. Sid, as shady as she is, shady people got shady connections all around the galaxy. So I, I would not be disappointed yeah. in that. Uh, Nova Toymation, yeah. Nala say asking that I want to I want to touch on that with Nick eventually in my ha moments because that the talk between Doctor Carr and Nala say I think is deeper than we all realized if you really analyze what what Nala was saying to her and and how Emery responded. Uh, in fact, since we're talking about screw it, I'll just go ahead and bring it up. Let me get a, a visual for us, but. I wrote it down, Nick. This is another one. I was like, I, I need to write this down just in case. Um, Emery says, there's nothing I can do. I don't have that kind of power. And Nala says, don't you? So the, the other thing was was interesting. When they first this conversation first starts, Emery comes in like, they're children like I was. Your plan is your plan to discard them too? So yeah. it was was Emery possibly Nala's first go at making an Omega? It's I mean, like we were, you know, like we're assuming here, I guess, that like, oh, you know, Boba is the alpha and then Omega is the Omega. But is Emery the alpha? You know, like you just said, I, I do think that that's a possibility. We know that Emery is of clone origin or we we're assuming that Emery is of clone oh, origin. She, she she said as much in the end of season yeah, 2. She, so Yeah. I mean, I think that like, like she didn't come out and say exactly that. Like she we she definitely like implied that like, oh yeah, we are the same. Um but yeah, now after this conversation, it, it it's very likely that that Emery was one of Nalase's experiments as well. And I just loved how vague it was because it 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 could be literal or it could be beyond that. You know, when she says like 
Mm-hmm. As Nala rep- re- replies to Emery saying, I don't have that kind of power, she she questions it like, don't you? Is it physical power or is it just she has the power, the capability with her access in Tantus to help? I like that it's it's kind of left to interpretation. And the fact that Emery yeah, does mean, establish like, hey, we had a relationship. I was a kid in your care and you just fucking threw me out. That that sets yeah. some precedence. Like, uh oh, what what exactly was Nala doing with these young female clones? Yeah. And and like I'm not a huge fan of like them forcifying everybody and I don't want them to do that with these two characters with Emery and with Omega like I want them to 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 stay non I do users think power is more literal important. in reference to, to yeah. Emery uh, be- yeah that like, if you think about she she her- probably was a failed she was a failed Nala say experiment so she's like eh get out of here okay yeah like and, and now she does have like she has very literal power like she Correct. has been given she's head scientist like, or whatever yeah, head scientist control in Tantus and now has full access right. to the experiment that is going on here with all of these children. And her visceral reaction as soon as she sees it is a very clear indication that she is not comfortable working in this type of environment. She is not comfortable subjugating children to the type of experimentation that they're being subjugated to. And and she's not comfortable continuing this line of experimentation as it has been happening for God knows how long now. Like you said, if she was a part of this experimentation under Nala say during better times, then fuck, like just imagine like during probably during Republic times. Oh, yeah. No, this like, would have been probably in, in Nala's lab back on Camino, the secret lab. Back she on had. Camino. Exactly. So like this like the experimentation that Emery was undergoing was during the best of times, you know, like pre empire during the, the reign of the Republic when, when clones were still being treated as like, Hey, these are very valuable assets that are, that are key to our success in this war versus the CIS. And now the, the, the child experimentation has gotten to a point to where it is nefarious and disgusting and, 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 and something that even Emery can't can't handle anymore so i really do think that like you said that conversation even with how brief it was is very yes. telling okay um, yeah i just I, yeah. I i'm glad you brought that up because i like that line the way she said it, is like there's 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 deeper meaning to what's what's being said here between these two they they have a a more rich history than we were led to believe uh yeah so i mean really i guess i'll, I'll kind of wrap up my review here so we can start breaking into the nitty-gritty it, it just uh, you know, identity crisis, fantastically dark portrayal of the empire. One of the, like Nick said, one of the darkest we've ever seen. And the fact that it was in animated form and it still made us all kind of cringe and go, oh my God, that is, that's the power of, of Star Wars for you. Uh, point of no return, super zippy pace wise. I think it was only 20 minutes long total without 20, credits. Yeah, it's 20, um, yeah, it's 24 total. So yeah, with the credits, probably but 20. But it, it, yeah. it was a great great 20 minutes you know no no real right there kind of open soft and then as as soon as clone x figured out where he needed to go it was like wham bam thank you man here we go we're we're back in a state of turmoil uh so i just i really these episodes wow you technically could have spaced them out this didn't feel like a true two-parter like we've gotten in this season it really wasn't a direct continuation uh, they did work well as as bookends, and they have moved the chess pieces into attack position. Like we yeah. are, we are rounding third at this point with the with a month to go here to to wrap the franchise. So a quality two parter here. Empire shine for sure, and I, I was okay with that. The batch they've been they've been in the in the limelight for the past few episodes, so I was all about getting this deep dive with an added bonus of. Cad Bane, who really is a shithead bounty hunter. I, I do love the just like all yeah, around. I, I love like, the character. <laughs> he looks cool as shit, but he is awful. Like he is just an awful, awful person. Treats yeah, Toto like, like crap. Treats his his marks like crap. Treats his clients like crap. Like he just he has no respect for anybody. No, he doesn't. Like he he is truly one of the most like just uncaring in like individuals guess, in the star Wars he, universe. He's like, is there a paycheck attached right. to it? Then I will do it. And he like, 
and he it seems like he only takes just really nefarious stuff probably because it pays and it's the easy most, i mean dude, you know? how hard is it to, yeah. to shoot moms with stun guns and take their babies yeah i mean especially when just, people give you tips i mean he didn't even have to look for it just like that you know that that ponda baba types like hey yeah, <laughs> literally he should have he should have done his actual voice when he called him because you know they, they talk like <laughs> But no, we, I guess he. <laughs> I, he, he I mean, could speak I think basic. that like it was such a it was such a telling moment too when like he completes the bounty and he takes just like a hand like yeah, a handful of credits and tosses it to this guy. Yeah, that's, he, Thanks for your tip, and it's just like you see the immediate remorse from this dude too. Like even as he's picking up these credits, he's like, "What the? F- what did I just yeah, do?" Like scumbag. Just yeah. Crazy, so yeah, crazy. a great episode definitely sets up the final four to be nail biters. Um, I, I don't know if it's as uh, there was a lot like some of the press apparently Nick they got the remaining half of the season outside of the finale and you know they are out there in spades licking balls and like you're not even gonna be able to breathe or understand. I was like okay, let, let's stop with the hyperbole. It was it was really good Star Wars, but it was pretty clear what the fuck's going on. So I don't know what these people are talking about. With they don't know how to handle their emotions after episodes like this. You know, get a life, okay? All right, let's get into some of the 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 finer details that our friends may not have picked up on here, Nick. And we usually start that going through some of the top moments, and and we've talked about it quite a bit right now but really the first one that stood out to me was our our field trip to the project necromancer vault you know it, it was made to be this big deal like oh hey yeah dr Carr, now that you're a lead scientist you now have access to the vault uh, i honestly thought they were going to walk right back into that chamber we saw him and palpatine in but no we are surprised with the vault being a prison for force sensitive children that all look like they want to take enough death sticks to actually die. And, you know, we, we, we've waxed poetic on this for the last 20 minutes. It was, this is it. This is one of the most harsh in your face portrayals of what the empire was doing this early on in its reign. The visuals were disturbing the complete lack of compassion from everyone but Dr. Carr was even more disturbing. The body language of the children was depressing. The hope in Eva was saddening. It just, yeah. I mean, dude, it was um, it was some adult level Star Wars shit in that scene. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you, yeah, like we had talked about before, it's just, it's just heartbreaking. And then like when, it, it was just the moment, the moment that really did it for me was like Emery sits down with Eva and calls her by her code designation. And she's like, oh, that's not my name. My name is Eva. And like just this, like the pure innocence of this child and the fact that like she probably hasn't been there as long as the other kid. I can't remember his Jax. name, the one that tried to escape. Jax. Yeah. And like hasn't been broken yet. And like you just see... All, all I could she see still after hope. that moment. She still has hope. The yeah. poor little thing still had hope, but by the end of the episode, <laughs> that hope was gone. Yeah, it's like it was so. That was the heartbreaking moment where, like, this little girl is just sitting there and looks at Emery as like, "Oh, well, you're my new friend. Like, my name's Eva. What's exactly. yours?" And and like knowing ultimately what their plans are for this kid is to essentially just bleed her dry. It was it was disturbing on so many different levels. And like that's the type of stuff that makes good Star Wars, you know, like as much as painful as that was to watch, like that's what makes good storytelling is like is is the the visceral nature in seeing the inner workings of evil truly wrought upon children. It was yeah, it, it was, was disturbing. It was great stuff. I mean it, it's it's tough yeah. to call it a top moment, but in terms of, of narrative storytelling, it was it was it was choice. Um, and really, I, I think Emery has already had kind of two pins fall for her to t- make a turn. Uh, I, I think the the first was Eva here, and just seeing the the depression she just levied on her, and and how horrific it is. 
damn it, what, what the hell was the second one? Maybe maybe I was confused. I thought I had oh the talk with Nala say. So the, yep, the, yep. those two things right there, you can you like Nick said, e- even her walking into the vault, I felt like she gets it right away that this is not good. And so yeah, it's like yeah. the, the, the wheels are already turning. The Eva interaction adds to her questioning herself, questioning Hemlock, questioning Tantus. Nala putting those thoughts into her mind furthers the questioning. When Omega shows up, that is going to be what bursts the dam for Dr. Carr. And and she is not going to be able to help herself from what Nick and I are calling pulling off the Order 99. I don't know if it's going to go that deep, but Dr. Carr now is going to be their secret to success. I don't know. She's the one that rats out the coordinates eventually. I don't know what she's going to do if she does awaken the clones, the the Republic Commando clones that seem like they they get off doing this type of cloning. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, the, she is she's right on the precipice, Dr. Carr, that is, of making her turn to a baby face. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it all like I, I think what it all comes back to is the, is the conversation, like you said, in knowing that she was a child of experimentation and like you know, she knows what these kids are going through and she knows how, I mean, she has an idea of how terrible it is, mm-hmm. you know, and, and probably in her own mind, she's like, I can't, I know what I went through. So I can only imagine how much worse it is what these kids yeah, are going just, through because it's now under the it's empire. So jacked you know? up. Um, we got some good stuff here from this away, Nick, let's go ahead and tackle this. Uh, he, he's asking, did anyone find Hemlock a little off in this episode? I get he's evil twisted, but he seemed unorganized like before. Emery, can I be the lead scientist? Sure. Can I go with the trooper? Sure. Up until now, he seemed like he has his stuff together, but he seems like he is winging it in this episode. Not intimidating. I know he's going to probably do some bad stuff. Yeah, listen, I'm with you. This is a way. And I, I think the pressure of not having Omega is driving him insane. That That's... Yeah. I, I think you, you definitely picked up on something. I saw it too. He he did seem a little more frenetic, a little kind of off in the distance. But I think that's just the, the stress of knowing that Emperor Palpatine could show up at any time and be like, "Hey, dude, let's go." What? 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 You you yeah, lost? Let's... You lost the thing for me? So. Yeah, it's like what? What's the progress? Yeah, yeah I, I, so. I saw that too. I mean, any person that is uh, under an insane amount of stress, they're gonna look like Hemlock did. So yes, we agree. Yeah, he's also he also realizes that like if I don't get Omega back, I'm dead. We're back to square yeah, one. Oh, if if not, yeah, I'm dead. dead. Like, like he, he knows he's dead. Like yeah. I mean, Tarkin reminds him as much. Uh, you know what? Great segue here. Next top moment. Speaking of of Tarkin. Um, He's in there, man. I, I just like it, it, it and almost for comical reasons. I, I, Tarkin is always like when he shows up, I love the the snootiness, the arrogance he brings, the the his condescending tone that he drops on all of his subordinates. I mean, he is just the epitome of a an elitist prick. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he is the prickiest of pricky far right motherfuckers in Star Wars. If you haven't figured out the Empire is the far right, okay? For those of you that, that don't understand that that's what George was doing way back when. Empire, bad, big things. They're just very yeah. racist. Right. They're, Fascist. Yeah, come know. on. Like, it's not that hard. Yeah. But it, 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 it's it. the reason I really wanted to talk about this, because it plays off of our little bit with Tarkin and his incessant on, on balancing the books. It, it, it's, I, it just makes no sense to me. How can you be an empire... That literally does whatever it wants. We just saw it. They showed up at a, a a peaceful location and without notice started blowing shit up, terrorizing the citizens. They're hiring bounty hunters to take babies. They're keeping kids locked up. They do whatever they want, but somehow they got to keep the balance or the budget balanced. And it, it, it just, it was such vintage Tarkin for how he's been portrayed in Bad Batch. Because if we remember him from season one, he's the guy the whole time like, hey, are these clones really worth it? Because I think we could take a discount and just, can you know, we'll go conscription. It's not really worth it, right? They're not really that good. Here, see, I'll test them. Yeah, look, see, they don't follow orders anymore. I'm right. You're wrong. We're going to save a ton of credits. See you clones. Blow up the planet. Why not? Uh, and now yeah. here he's, he's back again, Nick. Like, hey, Hemlock. 
you're taking a lot of fucking what, cash, bro. Yeah. Um, What's all this? But did he not ask like Palpatine? Yeah, that, that was like, like I, I mean, he, did, did, Hemlock eventually like, was like, hey, dude, chill out. This is a palp project. So back the yeah. fuck up. But Nick, it, it goes to show you, I, I don't think Palpatine did dick shit in the day to day with his officers. No. I mean, he no. met with the advisors like Masamita, Sly and them, and obviously Bitch Boy, but no one else. Like I, I doubt he ever he rarely ever talked one on one with Tarkin, regardless of how powerful Tarkin rose within the Imperial ranks, because clearly he's he no. has no idea that Tantus is is Sheev's personal pet project. Yeah, and and here's the thing is like there it it's so clear too that like once Palpatine was in power, the only thing that he was concerned with is how he would stay in power even after the dissolution of the empire cuz he knew that that was like an eventuality. Eventually the empire was going to fall. So as soon as he was, you know, put in a place where the Empire had sunk its claws into the entire galaxy. The only things that he focused on were his pet projects to make sure that he stayed in power. Project Necromancer, and then what was the 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 one that was in Battlefront Two? The the project, whatever, the one that uh, like essentially torched everything. Um, Cinder. I can't remember the name. Of it. Cinder. Operation Cinder. Like those were his two things. It's like. This is what happens when the Empire falls, burn it all the fuck down, and then once it falls, Project Necromancer will ass- will assure that I am one both alive and still in power. That's all he was concerned about from the time that he took the mantle as the Emperor. He didn't care about law and order. He didn't care about you know what the Imperial grip was on the galaxy. He he delegated that all to you know his his underlings to Vader and everybody else. All he was ever worried about was staying alive and keeping control. And, of the and punishing those that let his empire fail. I mean, that cinder was direct. Yeah. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't set up to inflict pain on, you know, the, the rebellion. The it was no, yeah, well, I'm, I populace. want you guys to start killing each other, like blowing up yeah. our own planets. <laughs> yeah. It's like burning our own <laughs> shit, like everything. Oh, Just, you gotta love the guy. I mean, you want to talk about a star Wars narcissist? I think Palpatine even beats me. Yeah. All right. Next top moment here, Nick. Um, ooh, that, I don't know, man, this, this one kind of hit me. It was right at the onset of uh, Point of No Return when Omega is in the Pabu Relic Room with Liana uh, to kind of leave their offerings, like, hey, the Bad Batch was here type of stuff. And and Omega chooses the, you know, some of the most important things to her and her family to leave there in text glasses and Lola. And I don't know, man, I just, maybe it was text glasses and, and knowing the sacrifice and the bond they had or just like damn this girl she's so freaking emotionally intelligent that that she knew that hey these are special to us and this place was special to us so we want to leave something here special for you all and hell you can even say she had a little foresight because if she didn't get those off the marauder they would have been blowed up just like all the din shit got blowed up on the the razor crest but i, I think this scene just reinforced like just how freaking caring this young female clone is and that she truly unlike any other clone has a a heart of gold yeah yeah i mean having been raised amongst clones and not having been bred for combat like she doesn't see clones as expendable line items like everybody else does you know, she sees clones for what they are. They're like clones are people that have their own personalities and their own desires and dreams, just like everybody else. And she got to see that from the moment that she, you know, came to consciousness in whatever way that she did up until now, where she's been, you know, working side by side with clones to try to bring the galaxy back to a better place. And she understands that, you know, their lives are as important as anybody else's so it's it is very nice to see that she is taking time to honor that sacrifice and you know i'm glad that that she was able to find a place of honor for for tex goggles yeah you never know i mean clone x probably went in there with a flamethrower and and lit the whole relic room on fire but it it was she at least had a little bit of foresight before 
the Marauder getting blown up. How about that? Another iconic ship bites the dust. That, that seems to be a trend now in, in Disney Star Wars. So yeah, um, yeah, I guess they at least haven't blown up the ghost or, or the hey, Falcon yet. They can't kill characters because they keep bringing them back to life, but their way of doing yeah. it is blowing yeah, ships. Ships, up. ships, no problem. We'll take those out easy peasy. Yeah. Complete side tangent here. It's funny. I, I, um, I don't know if anyone saw, but the news today leaked out that, you know, Punisher is going to be in this, I don't know if it's a movie or whatnot, a Daredevil movie or a series. Uh, yeah, so yep. Stump Buddy was all pumped that the paparazzis caught him in full Punisher gear, doubling burnt all. It's a pretty sweet shot for a paparazzi. <laughs> I'm like, damn, dude, how close were they? He's like, it's New York. They can be right across the street and they, they're not yeah, allowed I to get if- thrown out. So. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can. I, I don't know if I can share, but it's probably out there at this point in time because I know Deadline dropped all of like the actual Burnthal in costume shots. So it was, yeah, I saw the Burnthal it, it, in costume shots with Charlie, yeah. like the guy playing Daredevil. Yeah, it was so. funny. I was like, I wonder if, if Hank got the call. And sure enough, he's in his gear. I even got to see some clips. Definitely not not allowed to share that shit. Uh, okay, <laughs> what do we got here? Uh, blah blah blah. Pian pian. All I feel is pain. Okay, up next. We got the Omega. Yeah, I mean, honestly, Nick, this is just kind of a a full on here uh, top moment, and and it was just the Empire's brutality on Pabu. I mean, you know, we we briefly talked about it as soon as he he tracked his target within seconds. We had a cruiser up there. We had gunships dropping off a battalion of TKs, other gunships literally blowing up the the citizens fishing boats so there is no means of escape kicking them out of their homes if they wouldn't talk they would literally go in with flamethrowers just to catch their hovels on fire uh you had clone x essentially telling the mayor to go eat shit and die you know you you haven't even seen bad yet do you want to see bad i'll show you bad that type of stuff and yeah. uh, it was just another it, kind of in in conjunction with what we saw in Identity Crisis. It was another picture perfect portrayal of how horrific this faction is, and the in the type of pain and trauma and chaos that they sow through the galaxy on the whims of a Sith Lord. It's yeah. just yeah. It was like if you love the bad guys. This was your double episode block because they were out in force. They were flexing muscles. They were showing us who's boss. And uh, what they did on Pabu is a, a great example of why the galaxy decided to rebel. You could only take yeah. so many decades of this just straight persecution. Pure oppression. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I just I, I thought it was a, a perfect portrayal of. Uh, you know, we, we kind of went with the more m- mental assassin type of shit that the Empire was doing and inflicting on people in the first episode. This was more of the in-your-face war machine and, and what they could do. And if you think about it, Nick, you don't need highly skilled clone troopers when you can just show up unannounced, drop in a battalion of TKs on a peaceful planet because th- they're not going to resist. They're yeah. going to all run and be like, like ah! <laughs> Like, yeah, I mean, like these people were unprepared. They're not comp like these. These aren't combat veterans. I mean, these are people that are just they're they're they're, they're fishing villagers. Like these people have have lived their entire lives on this like idyllic island type of planet where they can just live off of the land and enjoy the the sunshine and rainbows. And then you drop in. Imperial troopers, it's over. It's over before it starts. And it's like, that's the type of shit that you see, you know, like that we've seen from the empire for, you know, well, that we will see from the empire for decades. Just need numbers. So, I mean, Tarkin technically was not wrong. Hey, let's conscript. Let's let people sign up if they want to. Numbers matter. And and we, we saw that. I mean, the TKs, they don't need to shoot straight. When you can just show up like that and kind of shock the shit out of a system, uh, you, you catch people off guard and you, you can win a battle with a pencil. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, Easter eggs references. Clearly no eggs once again, at least nothing that stood out to me. 
So we'll do some of the really stupid ass ones like, hey, Cad Bane and Toto showed up. And guess what? Corey Burton and Seth Green voiced them. Ta da! <laughs> Here's another one that probably only super dorks will picked up on. But Nick, this was the first time Scorch was actually called Scorch in this series. Really? Yeah, like it's like his name has showed up in subtitles when he's speaking as yeah. Scorch, but he's never been referred to as Scorch. So for the Republic Commando Delta Squad fanboys and girls out there, you got it. Although I will tell you gotcha what, at moment. this point in time, fuck Delta Squad, fuck Scorch. He is a piece of shit. I mean, he's he's Hemlock's essentially number one clone enforcer. He he's kind of in charge of the clone X's of the world. So eat shit and die, Scorch. You suck. Thank you. Clone Force ninety nine would have kicked Delta Squad's ass. Eat that, Republic Commando bros. Come at me in the comments to drive the algo. Thank you. Um. Okay. Bat saying they're calling them stormtroopers now. Um, I didn't. I didn't pick up on that. Maybe it was in the in the closed captioning here. We talked about the Sid reference. Here's a fun one, and I I took a guess that this was the the citizen he played. It was kind of that alien from the beginning of episode one where they witnessed the baby using the force. Um, mm-hmm. But Steve Bloom, the voice of Zeb Aurelios, was uh, got himself a little Star Wars work in this episode, credited as a stormtrooper nice. and a villager. And uh, like I said, I think it was the the green triangle head looking alien from that opening scene, but I'm not positive. But yeah, Steve Bloom getting himself some voice work, not as Zeb in Star Wars. Prolific, prolific. Steve Bloom, for those of you who played Star Wars The Old Republic or play actively maybe the the MMO. Uh, No. Uh, yes, well, Steve Bloom, I does, I do think voices Candorous Ordo, but in the in the MMO game, he is the voice of the bounty hunter player character. So if you've ever played the story through as a bounty hunter, that is Steve Bloom's voice yeah. as your voice. So we got that. Look at that. Steve Mail Bloom, bounty. Seth Green, and hell, there was another one I'll, I'll bring up here in a little bit. But uh, actual references from Star Wars. If we get to uh, kind of where F- Fee was at in the first episode, you know, she's talking to her droid about some of their adventures as the droid's giving her some shit. You guys always love that droids in Star Wars are ornery mofos, always mm-hmm. fighting with their owners, their masters, if you will. But she drops Ando Prime, Nick, which is a location, a racetrack indeed, from the Star Wars pod racer game. And then she talked about Scar and Null, which is a planet mm-hmm. actually from Bad Batch Season 2. I believe the first time they linked up with Fee and she sent him on that relic hunt and they kind of get okay. entombed. In fact, the episode is mm-hmm. called Entombed. So you got that. Mm-hmm. And like I said, your your last cameo of well-known Star Wars voice actors came in the same scene as Fee and the fuel droid, Ollie. That was Matt Lanter, who is the voice of digital <laughs> Anakin Skywalker. Yeah, yeah, Annie. Anakin Skywalker okay. in Clone Wars. That's cool. That's so cool. as promised, Nick, I, I had a lot of haws this week. Um, okay. I've deleted a few, but there's, there's still, still a few in here that we need to discuss. All right. First up, Hemlock and his green pads. In particular, right after he talked to Tarkin, he looks at his pad and he scrolls on it. And you can visibly see that the operatives he's looking at have different yeah. gear, different loadouts. One yep, has yep. a different helmet. He's got like kind of one of those Mandalorian guns with the tuning fork on the end, it looks like. The mm-hmm. other one is is more similar to Clone X that is out in the field. But we also got to see for the first time their their chamber if you will right right when it opens with hemlock in that room and he's staring into that red light looking at his tablet i believe nick those are where he keeps the operatives i don't know if that if they're getting like shit injected into them that they're getting like cyborg parts or if they're if that's just how they heal are they like back to tanks or is that how they're brainwashed because he said he said you, he said, you have to do this alone. The others aren't ready Correct. yet. Like, so they have to be going through 
it, it has to be some sort of either conditioning, like okay. you were saying, or like, you know, parts are being assembled or yeah. whatever, you know, their, their chips are being fucking tuned up. Because there was, like I, I, I saw a few theories on Reddit, like, oh, this this confirms that you know these operatives are you know phase zero dark troopers. I'm like, eh, they they all have they all have different that. armor kits though, so it, it's almost like this these operatives of Hemlock to me, Nick, they're they're um they're like Clone Force zero zero or yeah, or exactly. or not delta squad you know they're they're a specialized squad of clones that are all designed with their own specialty does that make sense yeah it's all like you've probably seen this in other properties before where it's like oh well here are our team of heroes but there's a team of villains that are perfectly built to counter yes. them it's it's almost something like that where he's He's taking the idea of of Clone Force 99, like Clone Force 99 happened by accident. These were clones that just like something went wrong in the growing process. And there was there were issues that gave them these, you know, like special abilities, but also like downsides, you know, like Wrecker is this incredible tanky character that can take hits and is just a huge muscle bound dude but like his his mental capacity is diminished so it's it almost seems like hey what are you he saying may, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> he may have like like versions of clone force 99 but without the drawbacks you know Ooh. so something like yeah, that i mean the one is is clearly bulkier i mean he's not the size of of wrecker and i guess mm. that almost leads into the theory could oh my god is clone x truly a clone of crosshair i mean that 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 is one theory i'm not completely off on i still think it being cody is the most impactful narrative wise because i mean look he's the longest known named clone he was the only named clone that came out of live action star wars yeah he has a fandom but he has no resolution like some of the other famous named clones such as rex wolf gregor uh, so I, I think that'd be the the biggest hit. But if they did, like you're saying, we have a, a you know a, a dark force ninety nine out there, uh, <laughs> it, it would be interesting. So yeah, I, I, I wanted to see what you thought about that. So it sounds like we were kind of on the same page. We talked about the assets in the sub level containment chamber. We believe that that is where Palpatine visited, and those are more mm-hmm. than likely like super duper force juicers, like Jedi, not just bums off the street that had the force. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, Dr. Carr has her in now. The kids are going to make her turn. Yeah, that we talked about that. Two, two strikes have already been kind of made against her staying loyal to Hemlock. I think Omega will be the last. Um, blah, blah, blah. Have to go with kids due to lack of adults and easy to test. We talked about how dark that was. Oh, here's a good one. The other females in the vault, are they clones? Cause they all they all kind of look the same, mm. but I, I did get a shot of one, and, and her, I mean, you can't tell because Emery has those goggles on that kind of make her eyes look bigger. Where this one is kind of squinting, but if you look, they they do all appear somewhat similar. But I'm not fully sold on them being clones. Yeah, I'm not sure. I like I didn't. They were all in that I upper room. It's like an observation room or a control room. Yeah. Yeah, I, re- I remember that. Like, I, I would have to go back and, like, get a better look. I mean, it's possible. It's possible uh, because, one, we know from Emery herself that she was a child clone that was experimented on, so there could have been more. Like, especially if there were if they were seeking a particular type of accomplishment in the cloning process, like, you would imagine that there are probably multiple iterations of Emory slash Omega until they reached what they wanted to in Omega. So it is, it's very yeah, possible I mean, that those are yeah, also they, they could be different. Cause I do remember another female scientist on Tantus that did not look remotely like uh, Dr. Carr here. So yeah. Um, but, yeah. yeah. League. I, I, I think bad batch is, is and has established Canon that there are female clones. I mean, Omega being, yeah. A, a clear example one. now, it, Dr. Carr also being one. At least she self-reported as one to Omega at the end of last season. Yeah. Uh, we got that. We got the Grogu vibes from the little furry guy. The Marauder is toast. All right. Poor Crosshairs in the mist tag. And, and what I mean by that is 
I guess at the end of the ep- at the end of the two episodes, Nick, did you f- did you feel more emotions for Omega being captured again, or for the fallout her brothers are going to have to face? I mean, definitely the fallout. Okay. Yeah, you that's, know, that's like, where I was at. O- Omega made the decision, Correct. and it was very easy for her to make. Honestly, like once it got to a point, she's like, "Look." She she's the one who had to convince Crosshair that like this is the right thing to do, you know, and I think that she had kind of accepted her fate and she knew that this gave everybody on Pabu the best chance to survive. So she was ready and she even laid out the plan. She's like, look, if I give myself up, you guys can track me easy. Like we've been trying to do this forever. We've been trying to get these coordinates. This is the way to do it. And Crosshair up until the last moment was like, no, it doesn't make sense. This plan is, there's too many flaws. Yeah, too in many it. variables, there's, too many unknowns. Yeah, exactly. So like he was emotional up until, you know, the moment that it happened. And I think that it is definitely going to be harder for the batch now knowing too that like once they find out that they can't track her it's over fucked like they're they're, they're like back to square one they're they're back to yeah, the beginning of the season where they had no clue where she was at or if they'd ever see her again exactly so like they are really going to be in like hard scrounging mode because it's not like it was before where the, the tantas didn't know what they had like now they know what they right. have they know how to use it and as soon as she gets back, the danger in is imminent. Oh, she's in the vault. It's, she's going right in, yeah. right in the vault. If not, putting yeah. her on ice so she, her her blood stays fresh forever. So, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, I, and so I, like, I do think Crosshair is going to take it the the hardest. And and I don't even think his brothers are going to have to m- remind him that this is not good. He he's going to take it personally. I kind of felt like the the tracking thing let him down too. It, it seemed like it kind of limped out of his gun yeah, a little it, bit They're like come on it, 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 i know his aim's been off all season but his hand has nothing to do with the velocity of the round coming out that that was a little exactly that was a little fishy i mean dude i took a screenshot yeah. it's already starting to lose its trajectory the moment it's out of the barrel and i know because of physics and gravity and whatnot that yeah that that's going to happen but we're talking on like a millimeter scale right when it's out of the barrel here he shot it and it was like Bloop, and just, just kind of like fell out yeah. into the water like it was a dud. Uh, but I I think we're going to see it crosshair at his most depressed, but I think he's going to be most resolved now for what he needs to do. And now he knows like, hey, there, there is nothing I need to do now outside of finding this girl. And it's yeah, going to give I him mean, that, that focus is... back and, and that his ability, it's going to give him that opportunity to – kind of atone for a lot of his missteps and bad choices. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely All agree right. with that. I think that like the redemption arc that we've seen for crosshair over these last few episodes has been really good. And like, obviously the redemption isn't complete yet. Like, you know, the, he still has things to work out with himself, with his, uh, you know, with his brothers. And then now there's this huge mission to, to save, uh, Omega. So I think that these last, like the last five episodes of this season, are going to be very, very interesting, and four. I'm really excited to see where four. four. Oh, I, four. I, I it's, think yeah, it's, it's a four. fifteener. It's not sixteen. So we got. Hold on. Okay. We got twelve is one. Thirteen is two. Fourteen is three. Fifteen four. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Four. There we go. Four. And episodes. yes, I have to yeah. hold my pinky down, otherwise it'll just pop up. Because as we talked last week, as I'm trying to learn guitar. I've realized both my pinkies and both my ring fingers do not respond to my brain electrical signals. They don't. They just don't <laughs> do it. Like if I want to, if I want to try to do four with my thumb and my fingers, I can't do it. Look at it. It's like T Rex hands. Wah, rah, rah, rah. All right. Maybe CH needs some hymns. Nice. <laughs> All right, Nick. So next week we know it's called Juggernaut. Um, I, 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 I think it's pretty clear that we're going to kind of pay off on the opening trailer there. I, um, I, I would need to review what this is the way was saying with the skirt, but if it is Sid, that would be interesting. It did seem weird if they were just going to kind of write her story off screen because she was a pretty big player in the Bad Batch series for the first two seasons. So I, I could see that, and I think that's – what I'm going to go with, the, the, the question is, is is Sid 
possibly locked up in an Imperial facility, and they're going to break her out since we know Clone X shook her down and got the intel to find Fee. And um, what I guess, what, are they hoping to just learn more about Clone X from Sid? That, that's where I'm going with here. Yeah, I mean, I think if they're going to track down Sid, then it definitely has to be based off of how, like, how did they find us, you know? And I think that they may have to go through. Well, we know uh, Fee is, like, is going to be involved, too, because she, uh, uh, she, she comes say, and Fee- gets them in the ship. Yeah, because like I mean, like Fee is clear, like clearly going to be there, there in here to like figuring out exactly how this all happened. But um, yeah, I mean, I could. And here's my thoughts on Sid. Like Sid kind of has already served her purpose in the show. And if they gave her an off-screen death, I I wouldn't be super upset about it. Like, but I do think that there is now valuable information to be gained from right. her, knowing that. She's the one that that yeah. either voluntarily gave up the information or was essentially it was beaten out of her. Yeah, well, well, I mean, look, look at it this way: how it all played out. I mean, Clone X interrogates Sid, as you said, probably slapped her around a little bit. She gives up Fee. He gets what he needs from Fee, and Fee was the one that took them to Pabu in the first place. So Fee is going to know what happened on Pabu, and she's going to learn that it was because of her her ship navi computer and she's gonna go well how the fuck did they know that i knew that pabu existed oh sid and i think it, mm-hmm. i honestly nick i think it's gonna be fee or the bad bad like, reaches out to together. fee and, and they link up to go figure out exactly how pabu got found out there it is right there done yeah no that makes Take sense. to the that bank another expert prediction by matt and young nick thank you mm-hmm. i will take my bow I can hear the crowd. (sighs) These guys are insane. (laughs) All right, man. It is time to start sprinting towards home and enter into the Star Wars Time Show fan segment. That's right, people. If you're new here, we do it every week. I'm not sure why, because we can hardly get anyone outside of the fandos to participate. So, A, we love you, fandos, because you're the only reason we have this segment. You're the only ones that give us content. B, at some point in time, we may have to stop it, because it seems like a complete waste of time. But, for now, you still have three ways to get in. We're going to ask you questions. You need to give us your responses. You're going to ask us questions. We're going to give you responses. And then, of course, if you're into Star Wars art, any type of Star Wars art, not just toy photography, you can use hashtag Star Wars Time Show and tag at Star Wars Time Show on Instagram to get in the mix. Like I was talking to Nick earlier, I don't know. I'm starting to lose a little bit of love for doing the uh, features every day. It just does, it seems to be counter productive to what we're trying to do Uh, i think it's already killed our new account on ig we're pigeonholed to like 30 accounts that see our content and that's it it seems to be the only the same toy photographers every freaking day so it's like we're not even getting exposure to the larger community so it may just not be worth it anymore i'm not saying we're going to kill the top five but the daily features may be soon ending because our instagram journey more or less was murdered last July and we're never going to recover and get the type of reach we used to. So, wah, wah, boo, boo. Sorry if we lose some of your toy photographers, but we may one day have to kind of separate from that type of stuff. Cut cut back on it it a little bit. Just go straight Star Wars. It sucks, but listen, I I can only beat my head into a wall so many times before it's like, dude, why, why are you pissing away 30, 40 minutes of your morning every day? And Instagram is just giving you a double bird. I'm not blaming you all. I'm just saying like it's just it's over. We're 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 kind of pigeonholed into a shitty algorithm where we're making better content than ever before and it goes nowhere. TikTok looking good, YouTube getting better, Instagram DOA. So just be prepared, people. You don't have to leave us because we're not honoring all of you every week. May may have to yeah. make a yeah, change. You may you may have may to have just to be to into us change. for not talking about you how's that anyways <laughs> we're, we're still gonna play we'll always have a fan segment just not not sure about the the photography features every day but let's not get into that now let's go ahead and switch on over to our questions we did get a few again from the 
usual suspects, which we appreciate you. I just, just wish we could get more, you know, like beyond the dune C puts out a question post. They get like 500 questions, 60 comments, Instagram's like star Wars time show, eat a dick. All right. We got one coming here for, from, uh, I believe this is Bango, our cop friend here. What was something lore related mentioned in the OT that you would have liked to see done differently in the PTs or perhaps mm-hmm. something we didn't get to see at all? Damn, that's such a good question. And honestly, I mean, everyone knows my I, fucking answer. It's like I've I've died on this sword so many times. It's it's stupid. And I'm glad we haven't talked about it for months. Anakin's fall to the dark side. It was nothing like what I what Obi was setting up in, in the OTs, even though he was lying. Even his yeah. lies were more interesting than how it actually went down. So that's my answer. I'm not I'm not getting into the the loop of why I think it's bad. I'm tired of being called a stupid old idiot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, honestly, this question is kind of deep, and I would have to take a little bit of time to think about like oh, you don't get everything. time, Nick. These are rapid fire, bro. Yeah, like. I, I honestly, I, d- I don't have one off the top of my head. Like something mentioned, lore related in the OT that you would have liked to see done differently in the in the prequels, or the perhaps Clone something Wars that we itself, didn't get to see right? at all. I mean, the Clone Wars. I mean, the Clone the Clone Wars. I thought was executed pretty well. I mean, obviously, there's problems with like the with. I mean, maybe it was like how the clones were introduced. I I, I got another. What about um. You know, Vader was seduced by the dark side and helped the Empire hunt down the Jedi. I guess I would have liked to see that more than just the one clip where, you know, he walks into the temple. And I think that, like, the thing that that my issue is with that whole line is, like, you're only – like, that is – that's Obi-Wan's slanted perspective on it. And he's already, he already admits later in the OT that, like, look, I'm giving you a version (laughs) of what happened. Like, I'm not – So, like, we know that what Obi-Wan tells Luke about his father in episode four is all through multiple different lenses that he that he voluntarily passes it through. And the creator not really having his own plan for what what was going on. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I definitely like, you know, the twin, like, here's what I would have liked, you know, like and 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 maybe it's not possible like i like honestly it would have been really cool and like don't fucking like because this is like don't everybody jump on me for this but like i think it would have been cool and it would have changed the story drastically but i think it would have been cool if luke and leia were born earlier and like they they were actually known to anakin and like then that puts that it, it changes the story completely. But I really do think that it would have been interesting if like Luke and Leia were born at the end of episode two. And like, you know, there, there's been a lot of people I've heard there and, and I could get behind this too, where it's like, we probably shouldn't have started with Anakin at 10. Maybe the first movie he, he should have already kind of been a guy been a little older. Yeah, and then like yeah, you're like saying, 15, 16, we could have really like, seen him as this, shitty arrogant teen more and yeah. then more of because the actual knight the hero and then even more than we would have got towards the the fallen hero yeah because like in my opinion if the kids if he knows the kids the kids are around and you not only do you have the secret marriage then you have a secret twins that you're hiding that that both you and padme are hiding from everybody it it just makes that character's journey make a little bit more sense because like as like you've always said like as it's presented to us like his fall comes off of essentially like fear of his wife dying in childbirth but yeah he, he didn't give two shits about the passenger passengers in her gut he, he could care less no not not at all like I mean, he didn't he, give he, a fuck he about choked the kids. her out pregnant yeah so like but if those if if, if you actually have it to where like you have the real life stress of like, fuck, I'm a father. I'm a secret yeah, father. Secret I'm father secretly secret married husband. to a, <laughs> Yeah, like secretly married to not right. only just like somebody, a senator, a very well-known uh-huh. senator. Like, and now that puts Padme in a position where it's like, everybody knows she has just given birth. Yeah. Nobody knows who Who's the father the is. Is Padme a who like, or what? Like it just it makes Hooler that May. character journey 
so much more torturous because he's not only he's not just tortured by visions of the future he's tortured by everything that is happening yeah. to him and like that's i mean like that's I my opinion it. on it i, I like think it, it would have been really like cool it. to see I like that it, Nick. i don't think any and then it also it makes the hiding of the kids that much more fucking crazy yeah. because now like he like anakin knows and vader knows that like He's got at least one kid out there. He didn't know that they were twins, but he knows that she was pregnant. Well, I think, I think and, you know, that it's not directly said, but I think he just kind of figured that since she died with a baby in her gut, that the kid was gone too. The, the kids are dead yeah. too. But like, but if you, like, if now at the end of episode three, all this goes down. Right, he knows and, they're and alive. Fucking, he knows that he has two living children and and Bale and Obi and Yoda also know that he knows the 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 amount of security around these kids would be nuts. Like it would be. They would you, need their own you, Death you Stars, to, essentially. Yeah, like you would have to send them to fucking Peridia just to get them out of there. <laughs> like, like you, like Let's just go, kids. It, it it's time to get the, in a force whale. Woohoo! We're gonna yeah, go hang I mean, out with Thrawn. It, it, it it changes the entire kind of ethos of darth vader as a character and and how he functions in the original trilogy but i really do think that it would be such an interesting story if hey, it happened that way I so like that, that i'll, I'll say don't worry the answer. only people that are going to tee off on you are the the haters out there and the prequel um fanboys so hey that, that, tee off all welcome, you want welcome please to my club. yeah I'll, I'll i'll reply to the comments for you that won't show up <laughs> All right, this is coming from Baron's Black Series. Best EU story, current or legends. You boys need to read the RCs. Yeah, Baron or Spencer is really high on this uh, Republic Commando novel series right now. The Republic Commando novels. So I've said mine already. Never but gonna I'll say happen. It again. <laughs> uh, best EU story. Shit. It's full. It's the full Bane trilogy. Like I said, I think somebody asked a similar sort, similar question to this a couple weeks ago. It's the full. It's the full. Yeah, Bane I, I trilogy. mean, for me, like since I, I don't read, I, I would probably have to say. Um, well, this could be this could be current canon too. So if you got some no, particular, I, 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 I'm going to say. Um, I actually think the comics have gotten really shitty, um, like like to the point where it's hard to even recap them. I mean, this, the, the Star Wars run is vomit. We're in Lando's trial right now for oh, going geez. against the uh, rebellion right before Return of the Jedi. Uh, Kotor, Kotor, the, yeah. the original yeah, with Kotor. Revan and that shit. There you go. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, like, honestly, if if Taika is gonna dip into that area, just fucking bring that story. Did, to did life. you see uh, the the Game of Thrones guys have come out? They're like, yeah, we're we're gonna make Don the Jedi, and then they. They took it from us. <laughs> and they're literally like, yeah, we're going to make like the first Jedi. I'm going, well, isn't that what Mangold's doing? So that's yeah, what Mangold's that's doing now. Funny. I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah, the whole thing with, with Benny off and Weiss and how all that went down is just such a huge mystery because it was like, they're doing this. They're going to work on star Wars. They're going to make this, 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 you know, this great movie. And before anything even comes out about it, anything at all, they're gone. And and they they Nick, they said first movie fully written. They were going to it was a trilogy. That's, they said they they had the general outline for the other two. Like it was locked and loaded, here we go. Oh well. I don't know. Wasn't meant Crazy, to be. But, hey, look at this. Yeah. 2797 in here. How will Fields do with the Steelers? All right, getting a little NFL question here. I I I'll chime he, in on this. He's going to have <laughs> a way better opportunity in Pittsburgh than he did in Chicago. It's just a, it's a better organization. He's got better people around him, even though I think Mike Tomlin is highly overrated. And if you're a true Steelers fan in Pittsburgh, or you understand it's about championships, not winning seasons and not winning a playoff since 2016 is inexcusable. He should be fired. But back to your point, if, if Russell Wilson can't get out of his own way and returns to year one Denver Broncos Russell Wilson I think Fields ends up being the starter by the end of the season and he's going to do better than he did Chicago which could lead to him getting his 25 million dollar fifth year option from the Steelers I I ultimately see Fields ending up being their starter next year yeah 
I, I agree 100% with that. I think that Russell Wilson is mentally done in the NFL. Like, I think that he signed this one year contract. He had a good, just like, to- stat wise. I mean, he had like 26 TDs to three picks last year, which was better than the guy that won the um, MVP. Yeah. I just, I just don't think, but the thing is, is like, he's, he's a weirdo. Like he's a weird guy. There's like statistics tell stories in different ways. Like th- that's a great stat line, but like the t- it was a losing team. He was the leader of the losing team. Their offense looked anemic at times, it, it, like embarrassing at others. Like I think that he comes to this team where you have a slightly better situation, you could argue. Um, but I think that they essentially gave him this contract and they're like, look, if you don't blow the world up, we got your dude, we got your replacement sitting right what here. What Omar Khan did is amazing. He he fleeced these people. I mean, we, we went from Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph, and Mitch Trubisky to an almost two time Super Bowl winner and a, a, a what? A, the number two draft pick overall yeah. from like a really ago. like Justin Fields is a really dynamic playmaker. Yeah, yo, I mean, I'm, just, I'm, a, I'm a Buckeye man. I got to watch him two years here, not not win a fucking title, but he sure as hell kicked the shit out of Michigan every year. Um, so yeah, I, I do think Fields will ultimately be the starter. I, I think Russell, like Tomlin said, is going to get the go ahead. He he has earned it. He's he's been a leader longer and has a proven track record, but. Uh, if he ain't getting the job done, they have no loyalty to Wilson, and uh, the younger guy is going to get the crack. All right, like yeah, so. moving Good into stuff. the question of the week. So uh, once again, this goes up on Instagram usually the day of the show. It's easy peasy these times when we're in Star Wars season. It's just hey, did you like what we watched this week or not? And as usual, the usual suspects. How many times can we say usual? Chimed in. Go ahead, Nick. All right. First up in the question of the week responses is Mando Mugshots. He says, wow, two great episodes this week. It looks like the Batch are back to square one after Omega's tracking device was destroyed. It's a good job. They know a former Sith assassin who seems to be an expert in that field. So it seems like Mando Mugshots may think that we uh, have a return of Asajj Ventress. Which makes the most sense, really, our, if you think about it. But I, I, I like where we're yeah, going with I, I think we start with Fee to Sid and then go from there. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think we might be on. We always have to be right. We'll see. Among shots, so that's all. We'll see. Uh next up 2797 Studios just making his second it's all over him appearance, and just whipping that deck wherever he pleases in SWTS yeah. land. <laughs> he says what a great couple of episodes really looking forward to what this is all building yes. to. Final 4 here we come. My favorite part was the Marauder going boom. My least favorite part was the Marauder going boom. <laughs> See, Why do I go. get so attached to these ships? There are like they, I think we, this we, is there like are a toy photography. Yeah, there are fans out there that love the vehicles. I, I mean, listen, I, I've always been mesmerized by Star Wars vehicles, in particular the Imperial mm-hmm. side. And man, it was great to see Clone X's ship again. That thing is titties. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, next up, League of Extraordinary Sixthers, our uh, loyal fan in the chat. And actually, a lot of these are loyal fans in the chat. Um, for the Tantus episode, I liked Kiner's slightly nuanced metro- metronome score. This variation was slower paced, giving the feeling that the uh, that time almost stands still in this fall. It what like that was another thing that I that I definitely noticed and just didn't mention in the breakdown was the the music itself just gave this super ominous vibe the whole time. Like the whole that. That whole episode, you're just uneasy. Yeah, it's just doom and gloom. Because of, yeah, like, and in, in the music definitely played a part. So definitely Kev, Kevin Kiner, um, high marks for that, for sure. Uh, next up, Johnny Osage Avenue says, Hello, SWTS. So clearly high M count doesn't make you a force user, or these kids would have been like these ones at the Oracles uh, in the Matrix. Uh, but was that different, Jax, right? Uh, he says, but was that different? Jack's right, not a modified, tested cadet Jack. Yeah, he, he is correct. I, there is a there was a Jack's clone featured in, okay. in the Clone Wars. 
Okay, so there was another cadet Jax, but it's nah, a different No, nah, this one. Jax clearly was the same species as yeah. Luminara, whatever the yeah. hell that is. Um, I think she's a, no, nah, she's not a Marillion. I know what the species is, but I can't remember it right now. Uh, I was hoping the Spurs was Alpha, but no. And in our next episode of the BB, the boys head to Tatooine to see if a young Pelly can hook them up with a new ride. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I, a I like young Pelly Moto. You know, I, I like Johnny's sense of humor. I'm sorry, I can't help it. Johnny's good. Next up, Lady Elaine 24. Oh, I know who that? that is. Who's that? Uh, she says, "If you know my me, mom you would participate. You would See, to, at least my mom helps me. <laughs> your mom's out there. She's a star. Hey, mom, and can you watch like, my mom, show, please? No one does. Your mom." But like she's not just watching it to support her son. Your mom is a oh, Star no, she's, Wars she's fan, a fan through and she's through. Like she is a fan through and through. So you, uh, so Lady <laughs> Elaine twenty four. Matt's mom says, "You know me. Uh, if you know me, you would n- uh, have have to know. I would pick when Emery makes sure the child gets Omega's doll. It will be interesting to see if she can help um, turn things around." Don't you around. worry, Lady Elaine. She she is going to be a a We've key been- part to sabotaging project necromancer hopefully saving omega and uh freeing the clones who are all going to die anyways because they need to that's right that's right so yes uh i think we've been calling for that for a while so hopefully that comes to fruition and then mando pirate here says woot woot these episodes were super emotional from seeing the little tyke get kidnapped the kids at mount tantus being lab rats and seeing pabu get ransacked was the planet that episode 10 started out on look like Zepho? Uh, 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 lo- uh, it looks like it to me. So it was at Zepho and it looks like it to Mando Pirate. I don't think so. It was um, like a moon. I don't, yeah. Where I don't, were we at? What planet are we talking about? I don't, I mean, episode 10, that's the one. Oh, that, where that, the, the little kid is at. Yeah. Yeah. I, it seems no, too populated for Zepho. Yeah. I don't think that was Zepho. But I could, I mean, we could be wrong. But if it was Zepho, that'd be, it'd be weird to be on Zepho and not be, and not give us a little bit more of an obvious like nod at it. But, you know. Um, right. So, yeah. So that is it for the question of the week. Thank you all for participating in that. Make sure to follow the Instagram to uh, get in on that segment. Next up, we have the top five Star Wars fan artist features of the week. Again, this is all done through our Instagram at StarWarsTime.show on the old IGs. Uh, to get involved in this segment, make sure to add tag at StarWarsTime.show on all of your Star Wars Instagram you posts. Know, a, and- a meaningful update here from This Is The Way. I guess the, the Kiner Bros were on a YouTube today, and they just said that they finished scoring Tales from the Jedi 2. So Ooh, it sounds like that's good. done, and I, I think we'll probably get that this fall again like we did um, season one. Tales of the Jedi awesome. was top tier awesome. Star Wars content like, for Dooku, those of you like, who have not watched In three it. short episodes, they, they turned Dooku from kind of a, a hollow, shallow character, in my opinion, to one of the most intriguing and well-thought-out characters, Jedi, Force users, if you will, of all time. Yeah, no. Like his, his turn, the, they made his turn so fucking clear, and it made so much sense why he made his choices in three shorts. Couldn't do it in three movies for Anakin Skywalker, in my opinion. All right. <laughs> yeah. See, you guys get me uh, started on that shit, and it just it, it's like a it's like a, a brain disease. It's just like a worm <laughs> in my head. It just sits there and, and eats at it. All right, man. Let's start. Well, let's guess let's what, travel Matt? through here. <laughs> Well, speaking about Anakin Skywalker he is. from the prequels, that's what we're kicking this week's top five <laughs> off, off with. We got Black Series Bonanza here. Black Series Bonanza has done an awesome job of recreating the episode one poster uh, that shows little Annie, little Jake Lloyd on Tatooine with the uh, shadow figure of Darth yeah, Vader it's the poster recreation. Uh, projected yeah, onto that uh, Tatooine house. So... I mean, it, it's honestly like a spot-on recreation of this of that poster yeah, image, and it looks all practical really too. Well like done. the hovel looks like it's some cardboard, you know, egg carton type of thing. Um, you know, you got the natural sand there. I don't know if he's outside or using a digital screen, but yeah, it's a job well done on this recreation from Black Series Bonanza. 
That's right. Next up in the top five, we have a shot from at Rila, R-I-L-A, collectibles on Instagram. And we went from pre-Darth Vader to full Darth Vader. And this, uh, this is a wide shot of our Lord of Darkness, Dark Lord of the Sith Vader here walking through the crumbled and fiery remains of a, uh, I mean, some place that him and his troopers just completely destroyed. The cape whipping in the background or like off of his back looks amazing. Practical fire effects and the the little bokeh from there as well. This is a super awesome and intimidating I, I shot of Vader. I have to guess, sure. Nick, that Ryla Collectibles may be a subscriber of one Sir Dork. Uh, yeah, that, this, that, that this seems to be dorky some to me. dork influence in here. P- speaking of dork, I mean that dude. I think he's almost to a hundred thousand subs over on YouTube. So um, I mean, he's about ready to just be it. making his money just on YouTube videos. So instructional content yeah. apparently is doing. That's what doing I should do because well. I'm a fucking instructor by trade. And it's funny, like I have <laughs> some videos from back when I was making technical content that still get hit. I mean, I have like gaming videos, Nick. Still getting comments on them from ten years ago. Uh, or in the blind forest, I, I put up a guide years and years oh, ago, yeah. still getting hit. You're right. We should start doing yeah. guides, but sadly, Star Wars doesn't really lend itself to guides. <laughs> I know it's, it's it's so hard. How to do's, that man? Like Wars. you are right. It's like what are people typing into their their search engines? That's what we need. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think Ryla Collectibles uh, may sub up to to Sir Dork because Sir Dork, I I think he is our our biggest ma- mouthpiece back to the toy photography yeah. community to let them know like hey. Uh, use the tag and all that fun stuff because clearly people don't hey, see yeah. our content but they see his uh we love all right the moving on Ooh, well. oh there we go star wars Ricky. Next, next up star wars rick star wars rick hitting us with the awesome mando right. shot and i'm talking multiple mandos here i'm talking night uh night owl mandos death i'm talking watch. din Djarin mandos death watch mandos heavy mando way in the back you can see his helmet up there um, but yeah, it's a Mando party here on on the light cruiser, and really, I mean, it's just a super clean shot. Fun to see all the Death Watch Mandos, all the blue Mandos, all the silver Mandos, um, and yeah, it's, it's just well posed, well executed, well done all around by Star Wars Rick. Yeah, I'm a th- this this Din Djarin figure. Apparently, it's the it's the Black Series based on him from his Book of Boba Fett dedicated episode where he's on that space station or whatever it, it really is like s- such a better looking version of this figure than the 5,000 other Din Djarin's out there it's not saying I'm, I'm gonna get it because you know fuck 112 at this point in time but that, that is a damn good looking six inch figure for people that you know aren't idiots and, and spend hundreds of dollars on their Star Wars toys per figure go for that guy right there Okay, thank you. Good looking. Star Wars Rick, stuff. always active, always posting, big fan. Next up, we have at Drew Originals on the IG. And Drew Originals hits us with the Master and Apprentice, Anakin and Ahsoka from the Clone Wars era. And I mean, man, this shot, there's so many cool things in it. I love the color saturation on the sabers to kind of add a little bit of green and blue to the the composition of the shot you get the the clone transport uh ships in the background they're clearly on a battlefield you got down b1s by their feet i just thought that this was a cool looking shot when it came across the feed and 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 wanted to drop this one for everybody else i mean see. honestly dude drew's been speaking to you because i think you um you anointed them last week in the top five and it, it, Maybe it, so. i think it was a Maybe darth so. vader shot so yeah, you, you know, musing out here. But yeah, fan of Drew Originals. Anytime we, we kind of give him a bump, he, he's always very overly complimentary, and, and I appreciate that type of stuff. Uh, it, is, it is a fun shot. Master and Apprentice. Uh, it, hey, I mean, it's it's they're in the form. We just saw them in live action in Ahsoka a few months ago. Uh, so seeing right. these two together, Snips and Sky Guy, always provides for a good-looking image. Make sure to give Drew Originals, all one word, a follow on that IG. And oh, we got a non and, and better. The, that's right. I had it. I think that's I had right. It ready. The final one. Ah, shit. It's, it's a clicky, yeah. and it's from Jesse Fireson 
I think that's how you say his uh, name. He actually I'm probably told saying me it how to say it. It's Fire Rising. Fire Rising. Fire Rising. Fire Rising. Jesse Fire Rising hits us with an absolutely clean and sick looking shot of the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy, the Millennium Falcon. And it's like, I don't even know what to say. Like, it, it's the Falcon in space getting ready. Looks like it's jump, about to jump to hyperspace. You can see the the star lines forming. And it's, it is, it's just the super clean shot of the Falcon. Yeah, awesome. And that's all I need sometimes. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's, it's micro galaxy. I'll, I'll show you the, the behind the scenes. It's literally sitting on like a, a, you know, like a bendy pole out in the snow. So the, 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 the joys of composite work, if you're good at it, you, you can really literally transport your toys and your art out of this world. And that's what Jesse Fire Rising has done here. Another very solid Star Wars artist. Give him a follow on IG. Ooh, look at that Master Chief shot. Man, I wish I still did photography. Is this the shit I've, I've had to cut out of my life because of the Star Wars time show? And I think, Nick, it's finally starting to bother me. Like, I think you should get yeah, back like, into it. Like you it. said, I, it's, that... I really need to reevaluate what I am doing with my life and why I do what I do. I, I do like making hey, the content. That... <laughs> like, Don't get me wrong. As much as I bitch about it, I love making the content because I think it's informative. I think it's, it's, it's good enough, right? I know it's not as polished as our friends over at Beyond the Dune see it never will be. I don't want it to be that good. Um, but I, I don't care what you say, man. If you're a human that, that is, is making content and you're getting zero reaction towards it, at some point in time, that is going to wear you down. Because, you know, I get a lot of other artists out there like, oh, I don't, I don't do it for this. I just do it for me. I'm like, great. If you really believe that, good for you. Um, if you do it just for you, why are you sharing it anywhere? Okay. We all, we all share for one reason, one reason only. It's to get the feedback. And we don't even get bad feedback. That's my point. Like we just, it, it, it goes nowhere. It's just like the, the, the machines have decided my content, the quality is not good enough, whatever. Our fans are too old to use social media. Who knows? But it does get tough. And it's like, I, I think about all the things I've cut out of my life to, to try and do this. And it's like, you know what, Nick, you may be right. It might be time to kind of get back to square one, break out the camera again. Yeah, get back to something that you're that oh, shit. you I'll have follow. That we, we weren't even following Jesse. In. Sorry, buddy. We'll follow you back right now. I um uh, I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, I, we got to have this skew to where we barely follow anyone and our number looks big. Our number's never going to get to where it used to be. I mean, we we're lucky to add ten new followers a month at this point in time. That's how bad it is for us on Instagram. All right, man. It's time to shut her down or well, what? That is. That's the end of the top five, and that's the end of our show for this week. Woot. So, yes, Matt, Woot. go ahead and close us out. All right, my friends. Sorry, you know, I, I don't like bringing real Matt out every once in a while because I know it can probably get a little nauseating, like quit bitching about it and just do something, right? You either quit or you keep going like an idiot. That's where I'm at. Idiot or quit. Idiot or quit. I'm going to stay an idiot for the time being. And I'm going to be an idiot over on StarWarsTime.net. That's where you can find this content that no one else can. We also have all of our links to our socials out there. So if you're a TikToker, we post daily content there. If you're an IG or we post daily content there. If you're a YouTuber, guess what? You're getting some daily content. I'm not just talking Monday to Friday or business hours. I'm talking we are a seven day a week content churning out operation. So get in the know, StarWarsTime.net. Follow us on the socials. Even if you're a tuber, you're a live streamer, we still want you to follow the show on a podcast platform. You got to beef those numbers. And when you follow, regardless of where you're going, ratings, reviews, comments, likes, shares, notifications, story posts, reposts, saves. You got to do what you got to do. We appreciate you all. And I really do. Those of you, you diehards out there, you know who you are, the bats, the leagues, we got a new one here, and this is the way the GROs, Mando, B Mad, Cole Cohen, 808. We love you. I'm not talking about you all. We, we wish we could clone 10,000 of you all because that's what we're looking for the engaged ones. All right, my friends, just keep stumping for us. Fight the good fight, promote the show. Even to enemies, you never know. We, 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 we are very good at pissing people off. So please, 
share us around because there's always time for Star Wars time. And if you listen to the Star Wars time show or watch its content, the force will be with you.